Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, and welcome to all our guests who are joining us online as well. This is the 26th meeting of the UK Belize Association, and you find us here in the Institute for Languages, Cultures and Societies, which is part of the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. I'd like to begin my opening the meeting by immediately turning over to Dr. Jamil Pinero Diaz who is the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here, to say thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you for hosting us and to give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit about the Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. And to those of you who are joining us from, from home, uh, it's a pleasure for the Institute of Languages, Cultures, and Societies and for the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Uh, that are part of the School of Advanced Study at the University of London to welcome you all for today's event on culture and environment in Belize. Uh, as the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and also a member of the Environmental Humanities Research Hub uh, here at the University of London, I'd like to say that we are very keen on collaborating with members of various sectors <laughs> beyond academia, uh, but also uh, museums, uh, libraries, uh, people from uh, all spheres uh, of society <coughs> that may wish to discuss uh, cultural and environmental challenges. Uh, so we are happy to talk to you about hosting events and being in conversation. Uh, on topics such as the ones we've discussed here today, biodiversity, climate change, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, I do encourage you to follow the activities and events uh, that are currently being uh, organized and presented here uh, at the school. And uh, I would like to, again, uh, say that this opportunities like this, uh, they, they are really important for us to, to build cooperation, diplomacy, and cultural exchange. Uh, and I, uh, I'm open to discussing ideas and proposals for email, and uh, we, we are here, basically. So uh, welcome. <laughs> I would like now to invite Barbara Bowman Thomas, uh, the chair of the local organizing committee. Barbara, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, chairman <coughs> of the organizing committee. That's that's a big that's big stuff, isn't it? Um, the UK Belize Association has been going on in one guise or another for about three decades. And Neil, I won't say very much more about its inception and, and what it aims to do, because I know you'll be telling us that later. What I do want to do is to say that for these decades, the, this organization has no money. And for all this time, we've been meeting at least once a year, more than that in the early years. And we have depended mm. on what you, you might call the kindness of friends. So I need, I must thank Dr. Uh, Professor Montoya very, very much for making <coughs> this facility available for us and for you to carry it out. And I wish Kathy were here. So that I could thank her for some weight. She certainly deserves that. Yeah, she does. Also, I think Neil Stewart, the president of the uh, UK VA, has been heroic. He has carried this organization virtually from his inception, first as right hand man of Peter Furley when it was first founded. Um, then as president, which he now is. And thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. I also like to thank you 
Daewoo um, of the Rampal Institute for providing the food today and um, lunch and tea and other refreshments. So, Neil, tell us about the UK today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. And as I say, this is uh, <laughs> this is an effort which relies on everybody helping, and just for everybody who's been helping to get us to this point today. A huge thank you. So uh, I'll, I'll use my sort of presidential um, uh, opportunity just to say a little bit about the UK uh, Belize organisation. I have just a small number of, of slides, which I, I hope everyone uh, can see uh, behind me and, and online. So yes, Barbara, as you say, we have been going for a little time. By my reckoning, it's our 26th annual meeting. So well done to those of you who remember back to the early days of the, the first meetings. Um, but also I think in that time, we've, we've had some things which have stayed the same in terms of our broad mission and ideas, uh, and also new opportunities that have come along. Um, not least the fact that we can welcome our colleagues online uh, now, which is hopefully um, something which is beneficial. And the timing of the meeting, which is now designed so that many of our colleagues around the world, particularly in North America and Central America, can join us. So welcome to everybody who's online as well. The mission of the association then is pretty much what it's always been, to provide a focus for research and interaction between people from the UK working in Belize and for Belizeans, whether or not you are at home or whether or not you are here uh, in Europe with us. Uh, so to so welcome to, to everybody. What do we do? Well, the most important thing I think we do is we try to create opportunities for Belizeans to work together, uh, to make networks and connections and to work with colleagues such as the people around this table and online who have a strong and deep commitment to that country. For me, it's been a privilege to work in Belize since 1991. And as Barbara alludes, the, the original founder of the association, Peter Furley, was working in Belize since the 1950s. All of us, I think, share a warmth, a connection with the people of Belize. Uh, many of us probably know Belize just as well, if not better, than some parts of our own country. Um, so thank you for making us feel at home in your country. We are then a network so that we can share news, we can share information. When we first started, it was a forum which allowed researchers working in Belize, uh, living in the UK, to come back and share that knowledge. That At that time, it was quite difficult to know uh, what everybody was doing. And that was the genesis for a, a group, effectively, whose common interest was simply the country of Belize. It was a synthesis. We invited everybody, whatever their discipline, whether or not you were an environmentalist, a botanist, social scientist, an anthropologist, a historian, you are all welcome. And I'm happy to say that that's still the focus today. We still have that unique, I think, focus in the country at a time when a lot of studies are conducted separately in their own disciplines. I think it's really refreshing. And I think actually that the nature of how interdisciplinary work goes means that we're in some ways ahead of the curve in having a meeting with a regional focus because we tackle some of the really important challenges um, from all our disciplinary backgrounds. And I think that's why it's such well, a welcoming thing to have people from all the different areas here. We also, of course, provide <laughs> help and assistance. We provide uh, focus events. We, we try and catch up with the latest news and happenings. Um, we're delighted to have both the High Commissioners uh, speaking to us this afternoon to give us, I think, a really good view uh, in terms of what's been happening uh, over the last year in Belize through both the lenses of the Belize government and the UK government. And I suppose the main thing that we do is this, we organise the annual meeting. Um, and that is a, a, an effort which we all collectively do. I'm grateful to everybody who helps me find speakers, find venues, find sandwiches, Everybody has a, a role in that, and we're super grateful for all the help that you give us. Uh, because what we're trying to do really is 
through the meeting and through the other work that we do throughout the year, we try and promote Belize as a location for research, for education, for tourism, generally building up capacity and human resources collectively as a shared endeavor. And when people ask me, what do we do? My answer, my reply is also, what would you like us to do? Well, what could the Belize Association do that we're not doing now? So perhaps we can put our thinking caps on collectively and think a little bit about that one. So what kind of folks are in the UK BA? Well, what kind of folks should, are not? You know, it's, it's a very open house. And as you can see from the list there, there's a very wide range now from the original basis of, as a venue for researchers to get together and talk about Belize. We now have all sorts. We have, we have some great uh, artists, we have music, we have film producers, as we'll see today. We have expedition groups. Um, we have NGO colleagues working in Belize. And um, so, you know, there is no limit to, to who can be a member. And that's why we all say, please feel uh, invited to join us and to let your network know about what we do. So I'm Neil Stewart. I'm the president at the moment. Um, I, I'm joined by my past president, Chris Minty. Those of you who were uh, at the Oxford meeting last year would have met David Howard, who's organized several meetings for us. Uh, in the room today, we're, we're delighted to have Her Excellency Therese Rapp from the High Commission, also Barbara Holden thomas author of The Naturalist. Um, and I, I know that we've been uh, joined also by colleagues in Belize. Um, we, we, we have uh, for many years been graced by the, the help and support of Alma Kay, uh, who was previously at the University of Belize and now directs the Belize <laughs> Maya Forest Trust. And we've also uh, had tremendous support from expedition organizers such as Irene Aventura Scotland. Um, Richard and Emma have been long-term supporters. Thank you for their website work as well as lots of other wise counsel from them. Kate has organized meetings for us before here in London and also uh, Mark and Penn who's here today, who's also organized previous meetings at the Natural History Museum. I'm delighted to say that uh, this isn't a fixed uh, list of people and we're always delighted to have new members. And we have nominations today, which I, I would like to commend to you to, to expand our committee a little bit further. Um, I'm delighted to say that the, the following have been nominated and graciously accepted to join us. So thanks very much to Annie Lou Burns, uh, who's the Belizean ambassador to Cuba. To to Jake Snadden, who's got to fill the boots of Elmer at the Environmental Research Institute. Uh, and also to Nicole, who joins us online today from Belmapan, where she is the British High Commissioner. So um, with your approval, uh, I'd like us to welcome these three new members to our committee today. Thank you very much, colleagues. The list of our partners is growing to the point where it now exceeds two, two, two sets of information. But I just put that there for you to sort of recognize our supporters over the years. And if your organization isn't there, to think about how we would include it, uh, how you'd like to be part of it. And, and if you know of, of, of other organizations that would like to join with us uh, in this shared vision, we will be delighted to welcome you and to explore those connections. So finally then, uh, to you, collectively you, you here in the room, you online, and you who may watch us later, um, think about joining the UKBA. Uh, as, uh, as Barbara said, there's no membership fee. We only ask you to bring your enthusiasm and your ideas. Maybe you'd like to give a talk at a future meeting. Next year, we will hear proposals for the meeting to come to Edinburgh, so perhaps you'd like to come and talk there next year. Uh, perhaps you have some ideas how your organization might like to work with us. Um, perhaps you can think of other people who really should know about some of the, these things because they would enjoy uh, being part of this and listening to these presentations. So if, if any of those things resonate with you, get in touch with us, contact me today or contact me afterwards. My email is there 
and you can find out more about us on the website that follows there. So as we say to any passing scout on the course, come and join us. <laughs> Thank you very much, just to pre-drop off, I have three people online right now. Yes, that they'll need to come online. So we'll see the presentation, we'll tell you about something, we'll probably do just a, yeah, I'll see the presentation. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much for that, David. Mm -hmm. okay. So our next presentation uh, is the, we're moving into the first uh, of, of our sessions now. And the first session is basically uh, a double act, if it's okay to refer to it as such, between uh, the two high commissioners. This is a, a first for us this year. Uh, so I'd like to begin by inviting Her Excellency Therese Rath from the Police High Commission here in London to come and talk to us and give us a little overview, if you would, Therese, about the present political and economic landscape in Belize. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Belize. I like to think that wherever we go, we bring Belize with us. So that's what we're going to put ourselves in the mind frame um, mindset today for this presentation. Um, thank you very much, Neil and Barbara, and to everyone who has been doing this and worked for this association for the decades that you've said. I'm happy to say that I wasn't born yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> so I'm really happy to, to be here today and I'm going to try to be as thorough as I can and as detailed as I can without going over the length of time that you've allotted to me because I think it's really important that especially given the, the, the length of time that the organization has been in operation, the, the various disciplines that have been represented here that it's important to put whatever you have done or are planning to do in the context of what's there now, what is Belize now. So I have, I will speak to you a little bit about the economic and um, challenges and successes of Belize, as well as some of the other challenges of the country. So that you, again, it's within the context of of where you wish to, you are operating and where you wish to, to operate. I am really pleased to have my colleague, Her Excellency, Nicole Davison, um, joining us after this. And so what happens is that she gets to correct anything that I say that's wrong. <laughs> and she's there, she's been there while I'm here trying to, you know, make sure that I get a good picture for you. So let's talk a little bit about Belize's uh, political and um, economic uh, update. And I'm gonna, aha. So we'll talk a little bit about the economy first. And so in the first quarter of 2023, the economic growth was about 12, 11%, which is high for both the Caribbean and Central American um, regions. In the second quarter, the economic growth was 7.2% and the decline that's really a consequence of the high inflation that we're experiencing globally, but still not a bad rate of growth. Our economic growth has been driven primarily by services, that's tourism. And I think that that was the big increase for the 11%. That you, you know, the, the tourism industry came back after COVID. Um, financial services, retail services, construction and manufacturing. Our debt also, I believe, played a significant role. And as we spoke about in the last meeting last year and the year before that, is that the canceling of the US dollar, 500 million US dollar of Belize's national debt and the replacement with the blue bond, which was valued at US 364 million, resulted in a over 12% reduction in our national debt. That money went from that restructuring is set aside um, in a trust to meet certain marine conservation commitments. More than 30% of Belize's marine areas will become protected areas, which is expected to be achieved by 2026. The Blue Bond has allowed Belize the fiscal space to borrow more money for investment in infrastructure, health, and education. 
A second major reduction to our, our national debt was to the was um, facilitated by the petro Carib debt. Belize owed over 545 million Belize dollars, divided by two for the US equivalent, a high debt that is attributed to the accumulation of interest because Belize was unable to make its payments to Venezuela because Venezuela was under sanctions. So during a visit in December, 2022, President but Maduro agreed with our Prime Minister uh, Brisenio that the debt would be reduced by about US dollar 267 million. It's between 267 and 327 million that they were going to reduce the debt by. Basically, the interest is what they're, they're, they're looking at. And the reason that I haven't I can't give you a specific amount is because the accounting is being resolved to ensure that the amount aligns with what both countries agree is, is what is owed. And once a specific amount is, is finalized, then that issue will be resolved. These measures have brought to debt to the, our debt to the GDP to just over 60%. And this is down dramatically from 133% in November, 2020, when the Brisenia government assumed office. So let's talk a little bit about the political developments. On the 14th of November in 2022, the government officially launched the People's Constitution Commission, Commission. After the enactment of the People's Constitution Commission Act by the National Assembly in October of 2022, the PCC Act mandates that the PCC is comprised of a chairperson and 26 commissioners to draft and guide the processing of promulgating a new constitution for Belize or amendments to our existing constitution. So that's what it says in the introduction mm -hmm. um, to the act. Today, you know, the end result would be that they submit to the prime minister a final report on the findings of the review, which will then be sent back to the National Assembly. The PCC is reported to have conducted hundreds of consultations and education forums across the country, but it is a process that is still ongoing and it's a process that has to be energized to ensure <laughs> that, that people buy in and are taking advantage of this very rare and unique opportunity that they have. The process you can follow on the website that it's stated there, it's pccbelize.com and they have a Facebook page and social media um, presences where it's important to encourage people to participate. Our, these are being done in the context of the national development priorities that have been clearly identified um, with regard to our human capital, which is, I believe, Belize's biggest resource is the priorities of the government have been to develop the human capital to meet the needs of a 2023 Belize. The emphasis is on vocation and technical training, entrepreneurship and STEM fields. This is over a period of several decades, I believe that there was a movement away from this technical and skill-based vocational education in Belize. And that has been <laughs> critical, especially to the services and um, the, 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 the factors of our economy that are, are driving our economy currently. Um, and, uh, another the primary focus is the development and maintenance of our infrastructure. And the government is seeking to improve the country's connectivity to modernize how Belizean society and government operate. So there has been um, some major, major efforts to increase our, our connectivity. Digital connectivity, which by uh, the digi digitalization of essential services for government, you know, like for now, investment is a is a is a is an interesting topic. You are now able to go online and register a company within two days. You know, so that the, the, the social security, all the government services are coming online. How you are able to pay taxes, income, land, all, all kinds of so there's a there's been a really major effort to digitize the government services while at the same time to in, in the training um, that has been ongoing, the 
there has been a huge amount of training to, to, to teach small entrepreneurs, people in rural communities, to, to teach them how to use these services online and to, 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 to establish connectivity centers where uh, people can go in to a, 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 a facility to be able to access this, the services. So that it's not only a matter of creating the opportunity, you have to ensure that people are able to access and use those issues, those um, resources. Another key area is our energy. The government is working to increase the focus is on increasing the availability and the use of renewable energy and the priority, priority, prioritization of solar development as, along with the, 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 the continued use of hydro and biomass sources of energy. With 40% with of our current energy being purchased from Mexico, this is critical for Belize in achieving our sustainable development goals. Mexico has already indicated that that 40% they need for their own consumption. And so there's a, a, there have been major developments. <coughs> the government has been given a loan in recent um, weeks and months in order to facilitate the being, a, being a more sustainable with our energy needs. Like everywhere else in the world, um, immigration and nationality is a challenge and we are working directly to address some of the, those concerns. We recognize that combating human trafficking and migrant smuggling requires very close collaboration with regional partners and the United States, especially in the area of intelligence. This is a lack of a detention center in Belize contributes to the numbers of persons that are imprisoned for immigration offenses. We, Belize has just concluded or just closed a, um, an amnesty program. The program, when the program closed, we had 12,765 applications. However, this number was lower than we estimate the actual figure should be. We estimated that it should be more in the vicinity of 40 to 60,000 uh, applications. However, there were some there were some very interesting challenges with the non-cooperation by, for example, farms where people, some of these people were, where they're not provided access or the creation of, you know, there's something of fair for telling, you know, not encouraging people not to, to take advantage of the of the of the program. But we continue, we are we recognize and we continue to work on it. Um, most of the people who apply are from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. The program's objective was really to offer persons who reside illegally in Belize to be brought into the formal structure and regularize their status and to be on a path to citizenship. This was a long way, I think, in reducing the abuse in workplaces. And once the person's applications are verified, those who satisfy the criteria get permanent residence. National security, again, we might be a small country, but we have the same topics of concern, challenges, and management. And there's a strong evidence of the presence of Mexican cartels in Northern Belize 
and coca plantations in western and southern areas. These developments have escalated the security challenges of the country immensely. And we have deeper cooperation with neighboring countries and the United States, United Kingdom, are vital. How do we operate within the region and the world? I talked a little bit about what we internally, what we are trying to achieve. We are very clear that it is not, we cannot do this alone. And um, we have a very, very strong presence uh, in, the, in the regions that, that we are associated with. CARICOM is the oldest surviving integration movement in the developing world. Celebrated its 50th anniversary this year. Belize was chair of the COF Corp, and highlight of its chairmanship was the dialogue between CARICOM and the SICA foreign ministers in Belize. So we see ourselves as a link between CARICOM and Central America. The CARICOM Eminent Persons Group is working to facilitate political consensus building that would be essential to a CARICOM or, or Haiti's recovery. Following their second visit, they noted that the high inflexibility of Haiti's state actors who address the crisis. CARICOM, specifically the Bahamas and Jamaica, were instrumental in the creation of the multinational security force for Haiti. As you may be aware, the United Nations, there was a resolution which agreed to the fact that, that Kenya would um, establish uh, a security force to be present in Haiti, and Belize has committed personnel to, to, to that effort. I think that is a really interesting when you if you want what you ask why would I pick Haiti to, to highlight in a in a presentation like this? And that is a migra a migration issue for us also, because people Haitians are coming or were, tra were traveling through Belize because you did not need a visa, and people Haitians <laughs> are traveling through Belize and going to get to the United States. Right, so applications now require a visa complete. Central American um, integration system, CICA. We were president for 10 of CICA in the first half of 2023, and we hosted heads and foreign ministers in the East. We are very active and we, we participate in everything. Belize seeks to expand its trade missions with CICA members. Um, for example, I think we have a very close agricultural relationship that has been growing with um, El Salvador or in recent days. The, negoti the negotiations that are underway for a partial scope agreement with that country and one already like, exists in Guatemala. It's a hemisphere on the margins of the OAS General Assembly in Washington, D.C. Belize and the United States hosted a meeting of endorsing countries of the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection, takes stock of the collective achievements during the first year of the new responsibility sharing framework in order to manage migration effectively and collaboratively. Doing a lot for a little country, aren't we? In addition to that, we, we talked a little bit, I talked a little just now about the regional organizations, but if you look at them, am I over? Multilateralism, let's look at about multilateralism. Small island developing states like Belize are the most vulnerable to climate change. Our countries are reaching the limits of our adaptive capability and are already incurring loss and damage, and we have to continue to fight for this. Yet those economic, with economic prosperity have been based on climate destroying activities that are attempting to evade this historic responsibility by lowering our ambition on climate action. We cannot be allowed to backslide. The effects of climate change are existential for us. We are losing land and habitat at a very, very obvious pace. We have been vocal at the United Nations about you know, unmet commitments uh, that are insufficient to manage our needs. And we are, have high hopes, as we always do, to be concluded at COP28. 
very sure that this is an, another unmissable opportunity to agree solutions to address the gaps in the financing and the action that is needed to address climate change. Um, last week, our, in the, our finance team was at the um, International Conference for Financing and Development. We're present, we're loud, we're making our case. Another issue that is on our horizon is reparatory justice, and that is the issue of, if you're familiar with the CARICOM, uh, commitment to the, the, the standing up for reparations, and so reparatory justice and the fight to, to undo the, the terrible injustice and legacy of native genocide, slavery, and the transatlantic slave trade cannot be ignored. So I think that if you, you see now, there is a very active movement in order to, to come to some sort of conclusion and repertory justice. Is, is, it's, 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 that says it all. Um, without further, or tenuous note right at the moment, but Belize has clear positions on Cuba, Palestine, and Taiwan. We call, we call repeatedly for immediate lifting of the illegal, immoral, and unjust commercial, financial, and economic blockade has been imposed on Cuba in regard to the, the Palestine. Belize regrets the loss of Palestinian and Israeli lives currently ongoing. We respect the right of Israel to defend itself, but we urge Israel not to exercise collective punishment while calling for an immediate cessation of hostilities on both sides. The people of Palestine continue to suffer the illegal occupation and apartheid by Israel and Belize calls for the realization of an independent Palestine state within its 1967 borders with all attendant rights, including the recognition of East Jerusalem and its capital and the right of return. Finally, the continued exclusion of Taiwan from the international community is inconsistent with the realities of today's world. Belize calls for Taiwan's full inclusion in the international system. We are one of the two remaining countries in Central America that recognizes Taiwan, Belize, and Guatemala. We have very close relationship with Taiwan, and we had the president of Taiwan visit us and um, to see the, the, the effects of a, a, a very, very helpful technical cooperation agreement that works in agriculture, technology, forestry, climate change, education, youth, and women. I think we have over 100 Belizeans in Taiwan on, on scholarships. I'm going to talk very briefly about this so that Nicole has something to talk about. Um, but the Belize UK relations, I report that they are in good standing. Um, we just had a, a, a very delightful visit by um, Minister of State for Latin America and Caribbean, Minister David Rutley, was in Belize from the 4th to the 6th of, the, of um, September. And during his visit, he had bilateral meetings with the Prime Minister, Brisenio, the Foreign Minister, Courtney, and a reception at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was able to have dinner meetings with the Special Envoy, the CEO in the Ministry of Human Development and the Women's Commission, as well as with ministers um, of defense, foreign affairs, finance, natural resources and the environment, and the CEOs. Additional items on Minister Rutley's agenda were meeting former Shivning scholars working in Belize in the area of climate and visits. And, and he also visited BATSA because we have the, the, the British military training there, um, facilities there for, for many years. The visit, after his visit to the coastal road, it culminated with a small press conference at the airport. In addition to that, we work, we have traditional areas of cooperation with the United Kingdom, and it, we, we are the bilateral Belize-UK relation, relationship continues to be most cultivated around security, the Belize-Guatemala territorial dispute, the Commonwealth, development, cooperation, and trade.
challenges more. The encroachment, the Belize-Guatemala relations are quite warm. In recent years, there have been illegal activities in Guat by Guatemalans along the western border, and these have been on the rise. These activities include agrarian encroachments, illegal entry, cattle, cattle ranching, illegal construction, devastation, land clearings, and some illegal logging. There has been evidence of coca plantations and activity in the area. Regularly, Belize's security forces encounter Guatemalan civilians involved in these acts. Of importance, the community known as Barrio El Huda, which has seen increased developments in recent years, and these developments are within the adjacency zone. Belize consistently requests and obtains the results of verification reports from the Organization of American States in order to ensure that these encroachments minimize we have a minimized risk of confrontation. That's very important. Another um, area of challenge is on our southern border, where the Guatemalan armed forces are operating in the Sarstoon um, River. And tensions have existed there for many years. Um, there has been encounters and disputes between Guatemalan and Belizean forces. And these have usually been solved through dialogue and to mineral, again, to minimize the tensions on the ground. But it is an ongoing and an urgent issue for Belize and Guatemala to conclude on a, the, the, a PSA agreement on how to manage our presence in the SARS school. Okay, and I'm almost done. But to let you know a little bit about the ID Belize at the ICJ. Um, as you know, we are the territorial dispute between Belize and Guatemala, and now Honduras is at the ICJ. Belize submitted the rejoinder, it's rejoined to the ICJ on the 8th of June, 2023, and written pleadings are now closed. Oral proceedings are expected in mid-2024. There's going to be an election of new judges at the court in November, and so we expect that that will delay the action a little bit. but. Um, the special agreement provides for recognition and the implementation of the court's judgment. So that implementation means border demarcation. And this will be an expensive venture. Belize is therefore again making already in the process of making appeals to the international community for assistance with that border demarcation when it's finalized. In addition to this, Honduras, we now have a, a a case with Honduras also at the ICJ. We commenced a claim in respect of the sovereignty over the Sapadilla Keys, which lies south of Belize. This is an overlap of claims by Belize, Honduras, and Guatemala. And Belize has always exercised sovereignty, but Guatemala claims the land, and Honduras has a constitutional claim over the same islands. So as a matter of international law, between, as between Belize and Guatemala, the court would refrain from making a judgment over the island sovereignty in the, in the case for Belize and Guatemala if there was a third party who was not named. To resolve that issue and to have a final resolution, Belize commenced the claim against Honduras. So by order of the court in February of this year, the following time limits for filing of the written pleadings were set. So you have May 2023 for the memorial December for the counter memorial by Honduras, and we have we're in that process. We have delivered ours. Honduras has expect, requested an extension of seven months, but this is denied. Right, and the sort of deadline is the fourth of December. Timing is everything, and so that is what we are trying to do. We want a, a fast and, and steady, a set resolution to this overhanging threat a challenge that we are we are carrying and have carried for some generations. So we are hoping that the both cases will be heard at the same time, or at least you know very close together so that it can be. So there we go. I think I've tried to summarize the key factors within some key factors in the area and the operation in the, the country which you are operating. And I hope that that has been helpful.
to you and I didn't go too much over my time. And I think maybe just to hold it just a one, we have this one question for, for three. Uh, there's nothing urgent, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss things in the, in, the, in the meeting later. Is there any, any, any burning question? Or may we pass to Carol? Okay, then in that case, thank you very much for a really concise summary of a lot of information, but really, really useful for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so perhaps now well, we can just uh, see if we can work with our technology to invite uh, Nicole to join us. Uh, Nicole, are you able to share your screen? And we'll just see if we can bring, bring you in your car. Can I just check whether you can see that? Yes, we yeah. see perfectly. Oh, hello. oh, my goodness. Uh, so you can see my slides as well, yeah? Yeah. Not really loud and clear. Oh, excellent. Well, that, that, that's an amazing start in itself. So um, good morning. I'm delighted to be able to join you from um, Belmapan. Not to make you jealous, I have my air conditioning on full blast at the moment. Um, but um, thank you, Therese, for that, that wonderful oversight. So um, this was billed as a, a double bill, and quite rightly, High Commissioner Raff has focused very much on political and economic developments in, in Belize. Um, so what I wanted to do was just use perhaps the remaining time, I'll try not to go too much over, but I might slip by about five minutes or so, um, to give you sort of an overview of the year past at the British High Commission in Belmpan. It's quite a visual display, very light on text, but what I want to do is use it to kind of show you the work that we do in the context of the priorities that we have as a High Commission. So, um, yeah, so basically, as I said, I've been here for a year in Belize, and what I wanted to do was basically give you a snapshot of the year past because it does sit very neatly against the priorities that we have here as a British High Commission. I would say against that backdrop, we are a very small office, much as the Belize High Commission is in the UK. Um, we're a UK-based staff of two, and we're supported by a team of local staff in what we do. And our priorities are determined by the FCDO's priorities from which we devise our country business plan, which enables us to focus on our delivery. Um, and the uh, priorities that we have for the year 23-24, which ends at the end of March, uh, are centred around growing the bilateral relationship in whatever way we can, climate change, gender and diversity, defence, and growing the economic relationship between our two countries. And because we are quite, quite a small office and we do have a defined country business plan, what that also enables us to do, in all honesty, is kind of push back on some of the issues that we just can't do because we really can't do everything much as we'd like to. Um, so, Neil, next slide, please. So, um, I mentioned that that gender is one of the things that we support. So, um, that is against the backdrop of having fairly limited funding. So, one thing that we can do is, as a high commission is provide a space and provide support and engagement by turning up, showing up and offering support in, in a kind of more practical way. So, one of the first events we had this year, after, shortly after my arrival, it was my first large event, was to host the fundraising gala to support safe houses in Belize. Um, so we provided a venue here at the, the residence. Um, I won't comment on the fact that it took place in the garden following the two heaviest rainy days of the year. So you can imagine the state of people's footwear afterwards. But it was an excellent event, which I think early on set out our um, support for the, for the gender um, portfolio. And it raised a fair amount of money for uh, safe houses in Belize and particularly Belize City. Uh, next slide, please. We've... One of our key areas, as I mentioned, is climate change. And to that extent, we've signed um, three memoranda of understandings this year. And I, I would like to say that, that MOUs can sometimes be a bit misconstrued as just being a paper exercise and not, not being very tangible. But in these particular cases, they are extremely tangible. And one of the first of these that we signed early this year was in relation to the Ocean Clean Partnership Programme, 
which is a UK funded 54 million pound project, which between the years 21, 22 and 24 to 25 will provide UK scientific expertise to help tackle marine pollution, marine biodiversity and sustainable seafood challenges. Um, that's been ongoing for a couple of years, still got a few years left to run, but it's an excellent programme where we bring in UK experts who do real tangible on the ground work, very scientific work around those particular challenges. The second MOU that we signed this year was in relation to the Biodiverse Landscape Fund, also a UK funded project to the tune of 18 million. And this will roll out later in the year, probably early next year. Uh, and it's going to support the protection of the biodiverse landscape covering four countries, namely Belize, Guatemala, El Salvador and Honduras. And I think it's one of the only organisations that is actually engaging on a, a sort of four country project that will be run simultaneously with partners in each of those four countries. So that's one we're particularly proud of. These two projects both feed directly out of our COP26 commitments where the UK established a 500 million pound Blue Planet Fund and Belize has been um, quite a substantial beneficiary of that, particularly around biodiversity and marine life as well. And finally, I'll say a little bit more about Minister Rutley's visit, Mr Rutley there on the left with Colin Young from the Caribbean uh, climate change from the five seas. Um, and we took the opportunity of his visit here to sign a regional MOU in which the UK is undertaking to provide on the ground advice and assistance on ac accessing climate finance. And that's particularly for CARICOM countries. So that's another one that will be rolling out shortly, but a very, very tangible area as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of our key events this year, of course, was celebrating the, the coronation of King Charles III. Uh, this falls very much into the category of soft diplomacy, but obviously was for us in the UK was, was one of our key events. Uh, we had a lunch party at the residence um, to which we invited 40 people. And the reason I mention this is because what we wanted to do for this occasion was actually invite, invite 40 people who work in the community, i.e. not the usual suspects. So we had a very different kind of crowd at the High Commission and we engaged with teachers, activists, people working with youth, people working with different communities. And it was a really fantastic event which brought together perhaps um, a slightly different group than those that would normally come, come to the High Commission. Uh, I think that people really enjoyed it. Uh, in the top left-hand corner, you can see a picture of Cuban artist Francisco Reyes. He lives in San Ignacio. And his painting, 96 portraits of the Queen, one for each year of her life. And that, that portrait now hangs in the residence. I'd also like to point out that I'm actually five foot eight, so you can imagine how tall Francisco is probably one of the tallest <laughs> people I've met. So, <laughs> um, so that, that, but that was an excellent day and a, a very much soft diplomacy activity. Um, next slide, please, Neil. Uh, visits are obviously a very important part of our engagement. I've been very lucky to have a fair number of visits to Belize this year. I think more than we've had uh, for quite some time. And part of that was obviously due to COVID as well. But I think we are really managing to put Belize on the radar of senior officials in the UK. The highlight, which I'll talk about at the end, was Minister Rutley's visit, which was the, the first minister, FCO ministerial visit since 2012. But one of the key visits we had this year was um, a visit by our UK Small Island and Developing States envoy, Rebecca Fabrizi. She's seen um, in the red dress to the right of Minister Habet. Um, her visit was really key because she is uh, the UK's uh, key envoy and advocate for small and developing states and represents um, the UK's position on a number of bodies around the world. So it was really excellent for her to, to be able to come to Belize, see firsthand what is happening here. As you can see, we did some seaweed farming. Um, she said that any, any work trip that gets her snorkeling is probably one of the best work trips ever. So I'm glad to say we knocked out of the park on that one. Um, but it's really important to get people here on the ground to see the work that we do, but also to give them really wide engagement across Belize, not just at ministry level, but also at, at NGO level uh, with people working on various issues. At the bottom there, we're, we're down in, in Dangriga with Penn Cayetano, um, but also to get them out into the environment to actually see the challenges and meet the people who are working to to overcome these challenges so so that was a really good one for us because rebecca has now gone away with a real vision of what is going on in belize which she can bring to the negotiating table as the uk continues to support the bridgetown initiative access to finance for, for SIDS, etc um next slide please um, I'll touch a bit on, on development, which is a key part of what we, we do here. Um, the, we, we were able to see the conclusion of two quite significant projects this year, um, both which have been going on for a few years, but both culminating this year. The first of those 
was the opening of the coastal highway uh, road, which uh, links independence to Dan Riga, and it also knocks off about, I think, about an hour of the journey from Belize City to to Dan Riga. Um, it's you know, I, I never knew it was possible to to actually fall in love with the road, but it is it's such an amazing road. It's so I never saw the original road, but I mean, just the features that have been described to me about the way it's been heightened to um, uh, make it harder to flood, the, the uh, wildlife crossings that are in place. Um, it's, it's a really remarkable road. So that was formally opened in July. Very sadly for me, I couldn't attend because I had COVID. Um, but anyway, I, I enjoyed it vicariously. Um, but it's also, for us, it's, it's a project that comes in under the UK Caribbean Infrastructure Fund, which is also rolling out in seven other countries. And what I'd like to say about this is that Belize was the first country to deliver their project on time, under budget and under budget in such a way that um, it was we were able to extend the road to Gales Point and Mullins River, neither of which were in the original plans. But because it came in under budget, we had money to spare and were able to make those connections for those communities to the roads, which has, I think, made a real difference to them. Um, it's a project which is a partnership between the UK government, the Caribbean Development Bank and the government of Belize and has really been a leading example and is now going to be used as a best practice example for other projects in the region doing similar. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, the other project that came to culmination this year was uh, the upgrade of five hospitals uh, to make them climate resilient. This is a project that we ran with the Pan American Health Organization. Uh, it included basically completely retrofitting these hospitals to provide generators, solar panels, etc., to make them completely climate resilient and to make them uh, safe, particularly in times of hurricanes, etc. So that we had the formal opening of those five hospitals this year. Um, it, it's also been a particularly good project because it's inspired others to, to take on hospitals that we weren't able to cover. So the EU have also funded two additional hospitals. So this project, five funded by the UK, two by the EU, has, has actually been quite, quite remarkable. And I'm hoping that others will pick up some of the other hospitals as well that we weren't able to get to. Uh, next pride, slide, please. Um, I include this because it, it's really, as a, as a small office, it's really important for us to, to really connect with other donors, with others working on the ground in Belize, so that we have a complete holistic understanding of uh, the work that's going on, partly so that we can support each other, partly to make sure that we don't overlap, but also so that we can fully understand some of the issues that, that are going on in Belize to inform the work that we do here. Um, so as an example, I was lucky enough to, to visit Bella Vista Village, hear first band about the experiences of some of the refugees community that were there, um, paint a bench, which was which was great, and uh, also you know work closely with UNHCR on possibly funding one or two of their slots here through through the UK government. We also work very closely with UNICEF, UNDP, um, the UN Resident Office as well, just to make sure that we have a full oversight and and can not not all be trampling on these other others patch. Actually, can't kind of bluntly put. Um, next slide, please. I mentioned gender equity diversity at the beginning being one of our priorities. Um, we held a, a large pride event here in the um, in August, really well attended and uh, very encouragingly we had a lot of senior level support. You can see the Governor General there. Um, we had uh, Minister Balderamas Garcia, Minister Courtney here too. Um, so really offering a strong message of support to the LGBTQ community. Uh, we remain very focused on this as an issue. We're following closely developments in relation to the Equal Opportunities Bill and um, uh, offering input where we can on that from our experiences of working with other countries who are trying to introduce similar legislation. But this was a, a great event for us, very supportive, but also very much in, our, in, our, uh, in line with our support for um, diversity and equity in Belize. Um, next slide. Um, just a couple of sort of more soft diplomacy type things. Citizenship ceremonies is another thing that we do here. Um, consular work in the main is covered from Mexico, but one aspect that we still retain is covering citizenship ceremonies. I have to say one of my favourite parts of the job where you get to swear in new citizens. There seems to be an uptick again following COVID, which is nice to see. Um, but it's also interesting to see just how many people are in Belize who actually claim British um, ancestry and British heritage. And that seems to be a growing number, which is, which is nice to have that sort of cross-community engagement. Next slide. Um, I, I would be very remiss if I didn't mention BATSUB as part of our UK presence here and as part of the UK family. I think all of you will know that uh, the British Army Training Support Unit Belize, known as BATSUB, maintains a presence here. Um, they have, they're smaller than they used to be, but they're still a very strong, very visible presence. Um, 
we work very, very closely with them as part of the wider British community and are always looking for ways to present a positive image to collectively of the UK and Belize. So this includes activities such as volunteering at the zoo together following Hurricane Lisa. Um, I also had the opportunity to travel to see their jungle training firsthand. I made sure I traveled in and out on the same day because apparently once you stay there for six weeks, the, the, the smell and the atmosphere can be quite grueling. So I was definitely a lightweight visitor to that, but it was still excellent to see. And they, make, they are a very solid part of the UK presence in Belize. Um, next slide. Next couple of slides are really just some examples of soft diplomacy, which is also an important part of what we do, connecting um, you know, some, some more sometimes unusual sides of, of the bilateral relationship, particularly around youth, sports, etc. So we were, um, we were pleased to welcome the Maribel Bowen Cricket Club during their visit to Belize. They played a number of cricket matches with Belize in clubs, apparently were beaten once or twice, which I don't think they'd like to talk about. But um, interesting to see that cricket is still um, <laughs> uh, it's still a feature because it's, uh, you can get the impression that, that basketball and American sports are more popular, but there is still a strong cricket presence. So soft diplomacy that brings together communities in a more unusual way are also really good things. And to that, if you could advance the next slide, um, Neil. Um, on the same vein, we hosted UK chess grandmaster Nigel Short here um, back in, in April. Um, and as you can, he played 20 games of chess simultaneously. This was a great media story for us as well, which I, I have to say quite unashamedly, we do try and get the British High Commission to the press as much as we can, just so people know that we are active uh, and engaged. But this was a really nice event where it was a knockout and basically he played 20 games at the same time. The guy in the top right was the ultimate winner, although he didn't win against Nigel. Um, but anyway, it was it was a fantastic event. Um, next slide, please. Um, the High Commission touched on on Chevening. This remains one of our most important bilateral engagements in Belize. We, we maintain a very active through flow of Chevening scholars. We've just sent off the latest batch. Um, I think it's four or five this year to the UK. Um, but we are just about in, in November, we're going to celebrate 40 years of achievement in Belize and we're going to be having a large reception to mark that um, and inviting alumni from across the years. It remains one of our best points of connectivity um, because I think the average is on return, returning from achievement scholarship, most incumbents go on to hold some kind of meaningful or senior position within five years of their return. So it's, it's a great way for us to kind of foster those UK Belize relationships because I think pretty much without fail everyone comes back with a very positive um, experience and it's, it's just a really good way to build that connectivity even further. Uh, next slide. Um, I've just got a couple more and then, I'm, and then I'll be able to wrap up but um, one of the things we were able to do as well that, the, uh, that was recognise the work of two really outstanding women in Belize, Ms. Michelle Irving and Mrs. Dorla Bowman, who both received the Commonwealth Points of Light Award, uh, signed by Her Late Majesty the Queen. Um, both were recognised for their work with women and in providing shelter for women in need. Um, it, it, it's, it's just an amazing way for us to be able to recognise the work that goes on the ground, but also connect with people who are doing really amazing work, who then work with us on gender projects and, and other areas of diversity and equity. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, Ms. Michelle Irving is from Dangriga, which brings me very neatly to one of the biggest events in Dangriga, Garifuna Settlement Day. Um, the reason I've included this is not, not because it's kind of like just showing us out about having a good time, but I, I do fundamentally believe that the only way you can operate effectively in a country is if you do your best to try and understand as much as you can about that country and show respect to its different cultures and try and understand those different cultures. So this is one of the first things I was able to do, and it really gave me great insight into the Garifuna community um, and just seeing the celebrations and understanding the uh, cultural richness and heritage of that community um, is, is, has been such, a, such an insight. Uh, and I've tried to do the same by visiting you know, Spanish Lookout, meeting with the men like community, um, meeting with, with different members of the different sort of uh, communities within within um, Belize. And I do think that it's an ongoing thing for me because obviously, you know, there's a lot to learn, but I do think it's really fundamental to enabling us to operate effectively. Um, and final slide, please, Neil. So this for us was really the culmination of a year's work. Uh, 
uh, not not a year's work in setting up the visit, but it was it was a kind of year of uh, engaging consistently with London and making the case for a ministerial visit, which then finally happened in September, when Minister Rutley visited as as the first Foreign Office minister since 2012. Um, as though I, I don't need to to repeat um, his program because um, High Commissioner Rath. Uh, covered that so so eloquently but uh what it has done is i, I would say that these visits are not standalone events they come, they come away with a long list of things to follow up on which the high commissioner and i are now both working on um and it doesn't just stop with the visit and it just fosters relationships you know foreign minister and minister rutley are now on on excellent whatsapp terms and you know it's just it's just the beginning of it of a new stage of the relationship um so that's pretty much a wrap up from me what i would like to say is i would i completely agree with the high commissioner i feel that that the uk police relationship is in an excellent place i'd also like to commend um the relationship that that um or the way that that high commissioner Ruff and i engage we make sure that we speak probably at least every six weeks or so so that we can kind of compare notes on what we're doing and i think that really enables us to kind of have a complete circle of what's what's going on and where we can work together and really support each other as well and for me personally that works very well so very many thanks to you high commissioner um but um yeah i think i will leave it there because i have actually gone somewhat over time so apologies for that no not at all uh, nicole i think that's been great and apologies uh, at, at our side for not uh, knowing exactly how the uh, the audiovisuals are behaving in this uh, facility, which is a, a little bit new to us as well. But thank thank you for that. And um, I think in, in the interest of time, again, just to offer colleagues a chance if there's one quick question or, or response. Uh, two two quick two quick questions, if I may, Neil. Um, yes, the first one is with regards to the bats of numbers. Uh, is do, does does Nicole you know, know roughly the amount of bats of uh, team that's actually in Belize? And the second question is with regards to sports tours to Belize. Again, does Nicole have a, a rough number of how many sports tours that we've seen coming over from Britain to Belize? Uh, so so on that the bats of numbers are slightly variable, but they're usually between about so so the the. the the permanent members of the base, um, and by which I mean UK soldiers who are there on a posting that's either six months or two years, is between about 18 to 24. Um, but what they do is that they, they support incoming units who then engage in jungle training for periods of six weeks at a time. That's usually about three tours a year, which could be anywhere up to 100 soldiers at a time. So it kind of grows exponentially at various points in the year. On, on sports tours, um, the only two that I'm well, the only there's been some rugby engagement here, but that's been kind of more on personal connections rather than formal tours. Uh, and the MCC tour is is the one that I'm aware of. Beyond that, I'm not aware of any other sports engagement here. But we're always open to working with with anybody who does want to come to Belize and engage in sporting activities, particularly with youth. Thank you. That's great. And that was Richard from Conservation Corridor, who's been actively involved in Route of Maya challenges and various things in the past. Yeah, oh, sorry, I should I should just add the British High Commission did have a team in the Route of Maya this year. So um that's that's uh, was our sort of contribution to that event. So that maybe counts as sport diplomacy. I think well, we have one question in the room from Victor Bonner Chance, please. Well, it's for both the High Commissioners, actually. And as you're aware, Belize has never won a medal in either the Olympics or the Commonwealth Games. And when you look at the impact that the victory of Kirani James in Grenada had when he won a gold medal for the 400 meters, I wonder, in your six-week conversations, what you might do to promote the possibility of Belize uh, actually winning a medal in the next uh, 10 years, because there's no doubt that were that to happen, that would transform the status of sport uh, within Belize and make it an attractive activity for many young people who at present might be tempted into uh, less uh, socially desirable activities. Well, I can uh, go first. So go ahead. No, I, would, I was just going to say that Building sports capability takes investment and time. And I think that you have, you can, you're beginning to see that happening. No, I mean, I think one particular sport, I, I can't, I'm not answering your question exactly what Nicole and I can do. We'll, we'll figure out what we can talk about. But volleyball is a really good example. And you can watch the progression of the, the, and the skill level of the players over 10 
years that there are no winning medals regionally. So that's where, where, what you, you have to start by, by seeing where are they placing regionally and be able to build themselves. So it's coming slowly, but you know, FIFA, I think, is there also a big issue with, with you know, investment and training and discipline for football. So it's, it's coming along slowly, but I think the sports visits would be a one way too, because that's exposure. Yeah, I can I completely agree. I think if we can do more on that, bringing people over here who then engage with with youth who um, might be experiencing a sport for the first time, and think actually this is something I'd really like to get into. Um, you know, the other thing that's possible to look at is, is equipment, maybe sports equipment that that stuff could donate and that type of thing. So um, we could definitely give it some thought, but I think it's probably a medium term strategy rather than a quick win. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that question. And basically, I'd just like to say thank you. I think it's been a really brilliant uh, initiative to have both our commissioners speak because a lot of what they say is complementary, but it's also very good just to have that dialogue and those connections between the two and for us to share a little bit in the uh, equivalent of your six week conversation. So, mm -hmm. thank you both to Therese and again to Nicole for giving us a really excellent first session. Thank you. Now you got some. All right. Sorry, guys, that you didn't hear all that I said before, but you, you can all give me a call and we'll hear from that. So I do have a challenge today. Unfortunately, my wife wasn't able to join me in, in, in this session today. Um, and I, I do have what should be glasses, but I can't see with them and I can't see without them. So I don't know. I think I have to go back to the approach just to see what the problem is there. Um, but let me turn to the substance of my presentation. And as I said, I, I really am touching on a very important part of Belizean history. But I want it to be a story that I'm telling uh, um, about that. And, and I really would welcome some feedback on that because I'm, uh, I, I was with the university, uh, university college London for a couple of years, not in any academic capacity or anything. And I've recently left that, but I'm beginning now to do my research and, and work, additional research and work and looking at publishing papers and certainly trying to uh, looking at the possibility of converting my thesis into a book. Uh, I'm in discussions right now with the University of Liverpool uh, and Press, University of Liverpool Press, uh, to have that done and, and, and finalizing my proposal for that. So, um, but my, uh, oops, I yes, see I have it here. So, so my objectives today are just a few of them actually. Um, it's to provide an alternative background and explanation uh, to the territorial dispute over Belize. Uh, as it relates to inclusion of the cart road provision, that Article 7 has always been so contentious in Belize. So what I wanted to do was to really explore, well, how, how did that become a part of that uh, 1859 treaty? What is really the story behind that? Uh, it's not something that uh, is properly ventilated in order in the historiography of, of, the, of the territorial dispute for us. And I thought it was... It, it, it made for really interesting research when I started going back to the papers to look at it. Um, so that's one objective. The second one is really to demonstrate the importance of understanding Central American and Guatemalan history, historiography for better explaining historical events uh, in the Guatemalan claim to be uh, um, to and the territorial um, um, dispute over release. I really think it's, a, it's really important for us to look at the context that that entire dispute uh, evolved within, especially the Central American history context, and see if we can find anything from that that, that lends to uh, our understanding of the dispute. And uh, just wanted to say, it's not an objective, but I just need to clarify that what I'm not trying to do today is to provide an examination of the broader territorial dispute at all, uh, of the border issue itself, or whether or not the treaty was a treaty of session. That's not what I'm trying to do today. It really is just to look at at how that cart road provision came to be within the 1859 treaty. Uh, so, all right. So, I, I, so in in May 2012, uh, President Daniel Ortega announced the intention of his government to construct uh, this of Nicaragua uh, to construct an interoceanic canal through Nicaragua. President Ortega first mentioned this at the meeting of Central American presidents with President Barack Obama in San Jose, Costa Rica. Days later, he again announced it in Nicaragua at the commemoration of the, uh, the 118th anniversary of the birth of national hero uh, Augusto Sandino. 
The following year, in 2013, Guatemala and Honduras both unveiled separate plans for dry canal crossings in their respective uh, territories. In the case of Guatemala, on the 17th July 2013, the president of Guatemala, uh, then president of Guatemala, Otto Fernando Perez Molina, announced a deal to build a dry canal across Guatemala. The Corredor Inter Oceanico de Guatemala was to be a private sector led initiative and at the time uh, was estimated to cost around uh, US $10 billion and be ready by 2020. This announcement went largely unnoticed in Belize. Even as talk about uh, building a national ref uh, referendum or holding a national referendum over taking the Guatemala claim to Belize to the CCJ was arguably beginning to gain uh, quite a bit of traction. Nonetheless, these announcements uh, by the Central American states are significant for several reasons, three of which I wanted to, uh, to, to highlight here. Firstly, they signal a renewal of centuries old interest in transisman crossings or canals across Central America. Secondly, the initiative was supposed, uh, is supposed to be a private sector led initiative, just like efforts to build a road or road through, canal, uh, uh, through Guatemala in the late 1700s to mid 1800s uh, was supposed to be led uh, by the Guatemalan Consulado de Comercio, or the Merchant Guild. Uh, and finally, Guatemala's announcement uh, should have refocused attention uh, for us, uh, uh, these scholars of the uh, Guatemala territorial claim to Belize, on Article 7 of the Anglo Guatemalan Treaty of 1859. That is the provision within the treaty for building a car road between the fittest place on the Atlantic coast near the settlement of Belize and the capital of Guatemala. I have emphasized the role of the private sector and used the specific language contained in Article 7 of the Treaty of the 1859 Treaty because I feel they are instructive for the purposes of understanding why this provision was included in that treaty. The existing historiography uh, of the territorial dispute largely argues that the Cart Road provision was included in the treaty by the British negotiator Charles Lennox White uh, on his own accord. And that if it wasn't included, there is no doubt Guatemala would never have signed the treaty. But where did White actually get the idea for this car road from? Was this something he hatched on his own on, in the spur of the moment, that is, during the, the negotiations? Or was the idea planted by someone else? Pedro de, Aicin, uh, de Aicinena, for example, Guatemala's foreign minister, negotiator, and grandson of, the, of Juan Fermín de Aicinena, uh, uh, one of the founding members of the Guatemala Consulado de Comercio. Uh, and if it was the latter, why a park road? What was the significance of this road to Guatemala? I will offer two explanations for this and show that this idea was originally rooted in the local reform concerns of a small group of merchants, officials, and scholars in Guatemala uh, City. But not what I want to say. So let me just move along here. I keep forgetting. So this is just general. I just wanted to show you a couple. Of, this is the, the route now that's being uh, developed in Guatemala, which is their interoceanic canal. It doesn't actually follow the route that was considered to be the cart road or what was envisioned for the cart road, but it has significant investments coming through and it comes from the Caribbean coast all the way through. I think it is significant because it, uh, it confirms, at least for me, that that was always an objective of the Guatemalan uh, political elites and authorities. Um, there. So this is an, uh, uh, one of the older maps of what was then the Kingdom of Guatemala. Uh, and uh, in, in, go in doing my research for my PhD and then just doing new research again, this is one of the most interesting years in trying to look at just looking at the maps and finding cartography and, and studies around that. So because this, this can yield a whole new area of support for uh, for opposition uh, in Belize. Uh, but I'm just only now beginning to get into the meat of it, and it's just exciting reading and, and, and research. So hopefully in the future, I'll be able to present additional information on that. Um, so the first argument for including the cart road in the anglo guatemalan Treaty of uh, 1859, I'm arguing, has to do with Guatemalan projects for connecting the interior of Guatemala with the Caribbean or Atlantic coast. So uh, and what I'm saying is that uh, it was always, so this thing doesn't, it works here, but, uh, so it always, they always had an interest in trying to 
connect uh, across there. But, uh, and I'll explain why that is. Um, Guatemala projects for connecting the interior of the country with the Caribbean Atlantic coast uh, through new roads or a canal was the objective of both uh, colonial governments from Spain and post-colonial governments in the United Provinces of Central America. The Guatemalan projects tended for shallow 19th century projects for transitional canal crossings in Nicaragua or Panama. And as Sophie Brockman, uh, the historian in Central America, who is now a lecturer at UCL's Institute of the America, argues, this was part of the reform project of a group of late colonial and enlightened reformers who imagined a new region self-confidently connected to the rest of the world through projects which furthered their visions for the region. As Brockman further points out, their ideas also have roots in Spain's Bourbon reforms in their American colonies. But in Guatemala, the administrative and fiscal reforms these included were not as far reaching as they were initially intended to be. And consequently, the Kingdom of Guatemala had failed to fulfill its economic promise and its many political and trade networks seem to have been overlooked by Spanish authorities, with the result that the region remains somewhat peripheral to Spain's wider empire in the Americas. Yet to the political elites and merchants of the Kingdom of Guatemala, the Isthmus held tremendous geopolitical potential, especially given its access to both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. To counter that lack of development in the Kingdom of Guatemala, the members of the Economic Society and the Guatemalan Consulado de Comercio pursued projects which helped promote their own plans for making the Kingdom prosperous. To explain briefly, the Economic Society or the Real, Real Sociedad Económica was established by the Spanish Crown and its objective was a broader revitalization of commerce and trade alongside other local specific objectives. The Consulado de Comercio, on the other hand, was established in 1993 at the behest of merchants in the capital from then Kingdom of Guatemala. Uh, and they were led by Juan Fermín de Aicinena, later the Marquis de Aicinena, uh, but was also established by royal order, supposedly for, achievement, uh, for achieving uh, imperial objectives. The two bodies coexisted in the late colonial period, however. And, uh, but the economic society uh, was in, in, indefinitely suspended in 1799 by a royal decree. The consulado was also later suppressed in 1829 when the liberals took control of the government in Guatemala, but was restored in 1839 when Rafael Carrera and the conservative uh, 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 rose to power in the conservatives resumed seat of government in, in Guatemala. The economic society was the companion institution to the consulado and both were expected to improve the economic situation of the kingdom, which by the late 1800s relied mainly on exports of indigo. Although they both had extensive common membership, the two institutions often had competing political and economic objectives, and there was little effort to coordinate their programs into a unified development plan. For instance, the Economic Society was interested in long-term development projects which would benefit the wider Central American region, while the Consulado was interested more in projects, including road and, road and port infrastructure projects, which would extend and protect the monopoly of, the, of commerce of the Guatemalan merchants. And that's important because the Consulado's emphasis on projects that benefited the merchants was a problem, if only because the Central American states did not emerge from independence with political lines and provincial divisions already decided. And hence, the, the province of Guatemala and what areas this included was arguably still conceptual. What was clear was that, it, was that Guatemala was the seat of economic and political power in the region, and those in other provinces, the Provincianos, um, um, had significant grievances over, over that. Um, after the economic society was reconstituted in 1811 and thereabouts, all grievances resurfaced. And these disagreements, as history now tells us, later turned into a bitter civil war in Central America. And as I showed in my doctoral uh, dissertation, the seizure of the port at Omoa on the Caribbean coast of Honduras by forces loyal to the authorities in, in Comayagua, um, Honduras, which was fine uh, for, uh, for, for being the seat of power in Central America with Guatemala, was the key trigger for the escalation of Guatemala's claim to Belize in the 1830s. But that is a story for another time and another place. 
I should also add that the internecine wars in the region were one of the reasons why negotiations for a treaty of friendship, commerce, and navigation between Guatemala and Britain in the 1830s had stalled. All right. So returning to the matter of the projects of the uh, Guatemala Consulado, one of the things the Consulado members were interested in were communication, that is transportation projects involving road and port networks that would allow them to rewrite the colonial trade networks to establishing new trade routes that reinforce their economic and political dominance in the kingdom. In short, what the Consulado members sought was roads and routes that connected the interior with the coast. But the existing colonial network was the most rudimentary and the mountainous terrain, uh, coupled with plethora of rivers made navigating this and the colonial uh, difficult and the colonial era trade roads did not support connecting the interior with the coast. Um, indeed, the lack of internal transport in the Kingdom of Guatemala had for decades prevented the trade of goods between provinces and stymied its exports, particularly in the Goa Lake Cochinil, which uh, Guatemala was known for. In short, the bad roads and lack of appropriate road networks were responsible, quite responsible for Guatemala's economic backwardness. In his landmark study about what the Guatemalan Consulado Professor Ralph Woodward Jr. showed that the Merchant Guild comprised of persons directly concerned in the overseas uh, trade of Guatemala, that the large scale and retail merchants, importers, exporters sought to protect and expand the monopoly that the merchants held over first the indigo trade. Uh, and later Cochinil, both used in the production of dyes, most of which was exported to England. In 1793, annual indigo production in Guatemala stood at around 1,150,000 pounds. But by 1818, this had declined to just 332,000 pounds, around the same time when the Captain General of Guatemala briefly liberalized trade with Belize, uh, with the, the little colony in Belize, uh, a settlement in Belize. A report by the Consulado in 1821 identified inadequate transportation facilities, that is, roads and networks, as one of the causes of this decline. And during the early period of the Consulado's existence uh, in the late colonial, Guatemala Strait with Spain and the colonies was carried out principally through the Caribbean ports of Omoa, Omoa and Trujillo, with less of this trade taking place through Guatemala's Pacific ports. But there was a thriving contraband trade with Belize, which was also carried on through the Gulf of Dulce, also known as the Puerto del Golfo region, and that went through from the uh, port of Isabel. Thus, the Consulado concentrated its efforts on improving communication between the capital and ports uh, on the Caribbean coast, especially after independence. For instance, following the reestablishment of the Consulado in 1839, uh, it focused on road and port uh, projects in the Lake Isabel region which reflected the commercial orientation of priorities of the merchant organization. In 1804, the Consulado proposed that the port at Isabel and Gulf of Dulce be formally uh, established and a road opened from there to the capital. And this road, the very road that was contemplated by Article 7 of the anglo Guatemalan Treaty of 1859, was approved by the Spanish Crown of, in December of that year. This is in 1804. In 1808, the Syndic of Guatemala uh, Miguel Gonzalez presented a plan for widening the rudimentary route and mule trail that existed from Isabel to the capital to accommodate carts and carriages. But this was disapproved by the Captain General because of the cost. Then in 1811, an alternate route, route from Refugio, Refugio, also in the Gulf of Dulce, was contemplated, but that idea was shortly abandoned. Therefore, in 1816, uh, the efforts for upgrading and restoring the road from Isabel to the capital was restored. Uh, and, but by this time, uh, the, the, car, the mule track that uh, exists there had fallen to significant disrepair. Uh, and, and the onset of the rainy season that year delayed things uh, uh, until 1818, the Puerto del Golfo was closed by the order of the Captain, Gen Captain General. Um, Carlos Urrutia in Montoya, largely in response to increasing contraband and piracy coming through uh, Lake Isabel, uh, the, um, Isabel, Puerto Isabel, and the, and the Gulf of Dulce. Rather um, counterintuitively as well, Cap the Captain General also removed the garrison that was stationed at Port San Felipe, which of course just uh, left it wide open for, for further um, piracy to happen. 
During the period in which the Gulf of Gotha was closed, efforts to use, to use other roads, including navigation of the Rio Mantagua and the road to Omoa and Honduras, had led to many mishaps, and the consulado was strongly opposed to compulsory use of Omoa. The consulado argued that this would cause significant delays in checking and delivering merchandise uh, and goods, and as luck would have it, Omoa was badly damaged by fire, and the consulado, of course, used that to argue against the Omoa road, even after Isabel itself was also destroyed by fire. Uh, in 1821, the Crown had authorized the reopening of Isabel, but this news did not reach the consulado of Guatemala until three or more months after they had uh, already declared their independence from Spain. After independence, the consulado continued to place great emphasis on establishing trade routes connecting its interior, the capital, with ports in the Caribbean coast from which it could carry on trade with Britain, Europe, and, and North America. Their primary interest was for developing the port of Isabel. Uh, but Santa Tomas was from time to time viewed as an alternative. Um, both these roads suffered severe deficiencies, chief of which was the difficult road network connecting from the ports to the capital, but also the lack of colonization of the area. The Guatemalan authorities tried several times to address uh, the latter issue through programs for relocating carriers from Trujillo and Honduras, uh, but the lack of funds always undermined this happening. Though in 1840 and 1841, uh, some 80 Caribs and Negroes from Trujillo and Belize were taken to work in the Gulf of Dulce area under the supervision of two Englishmen named Robert Smith and John Bailey with limited success. In 1829, then, the Consulado was suppressed, uh, but the Sociedad Economica discussed plans for new ports in the Gulf of Dulce region. Uh, and during the 1830s, the Guatemala government also planned an extensive series of club, public road and, and port improvements, but lack of finances and the civil war prevented many of these from being completed. Um, prior, to the, prior to its suppression, the consulado policy was consistent. It strove to establish a satisfactory port in the Gulf of Dulce near Isabel and build a road from there to the capital, and there was little interest in developing the Pacific ports. During the 1820s, uh, the real Caribbean port for Guatemala, however, was the port of Belize, which is interesting, with goods transported on pit pans and small skips. Now, these are words we all hear from growing up about a pit pan and sailing sloops, the very type of sailing sloops that uh, Belizeans continue to raise on bar in this regatta days in the port and the harbor in Belize. So, I, I found that just really, really interesting reading when I was reading the picture. And it's about really served only as a transshipment point for goods. In the meantime, plans by the Guatemalan government to establish Santo, Santo Tomas as the port in the Gulf of Dulce fell short, and therefore Isabel remained by default the main port. So there was always tensions between the, uh, the government authorities in Guatemala and the merchants. What the, what the authorities wanted was many times different from what the merchants wanted and, and was able to get it done. In 1839, the Guatemalan consulado was re-established re re and a and a legislative decree that year gave them permission and the precedence to develop the port of Isabel. Uh, by 1842, the Guatemalan government offered a contract to a Belgian company, uh, the Belgian Colonization Company, but the Guatemalan merchants were strongly opposed to that, and that was for development of the port of Santo Tomas. And they were strongly opposed to that. The upside to that, however, was that the Belgian company took great interest in building some of the road networks around Santo, Santo Tomas and between Santo Tomas and the Rio Mantago. So that in 1849, Santo Tomas was made the official port of the Caribbean coast by presidential decree. But the inaccessibility of, it, of the place um, meant that within a two year period, Isabel had resumed its, its place as the default Caribbean port for trade of Guatemala. The following year, a suggestion by the English uh, engineer John Bailey, who was himself very interested in building an interoceanic canal there, uh, in, uh, that there were efforts to do that in 1850 by building a canal around the river, uh, uh, the Montago River. But the, the consulado strongly resisted that. The Belgian company also had developed a plan for at least map roads in the Gulf of Dulce region. And hence, the consulado turned its attention to opening the road between El Mico on the Isabel Road and Santo Tomas. They did everything possible to try to get that road built between the coast and the capital. Um, in June 1855, uh, in the 1850s, uh, President Rafael Carrera even took a personal interest in getting the road carriageway built 
as far as Sakapa, which is on the road that I showed you that's not so the road that we consider is long here. So I mean Dr. Ferrer, the president actually said, well let's just try to build it to Sakapa and then at least I can go down in my carriages and get to uh, um, um to the uh, Lady Sabal uh, or the Golf of Dulce, sorry. Thereafter, the Consulado made only uh, most necessary improvements and repairs to the road, but sought investments for completing the remainder of the road all the way uh, to East between uh, to Isabel. The completion of the railroad across Panama in 1855 shifted trade to ports on the Pacific coast, and with this, the Consulado's attention also turned to building uh, roads on that, on that coast. But for more than half a century, the overland road from Isabel, that is the car road from there, the capital was the most important thoroughfare in Guatemala and was the road over which most of the trade of Guatemala moved. British investment for completing the road, which the government of Guatemala believed it had secured with the Anglo Guatemala Treaty of 1859, would have allowed Guatemala to establish an inter oceanic canal road through its territory, and with this, the power and dominance of the Guatemalan merchants would have been secured. But the second point, which now leads me to the second point um, that I wanted to raise. Um, is that the second argument I have regards the inclusion of the cargo provision in the treaty it has to do with the Central American projects for establishing an interoceanic canal crossing in the region um, in the middle of the 19th century, that's in the middle of the 1800s. Projects for establishing a transmission route uh, in Central America date back as far as the 1500s. In, in 1514, Puerto Rias Davila was, uh, was requested by the Spanish Crown to find a practical route across the isthmus of Panama. That is between the North and South Seas to facilitate, facilitate Spain's trade with Peru. In 1521, Diego de Ordas, one of the conquistadors that was part of Fernando Cortes's party in Mexico, reported that, that there was a waterway route across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in Mexico. Around the same time, Gil Gonzalez Davila, a colleague of Pedrías, discovered Lake Nicaragua and soon their search for the elusive route from the Atlantic Pacific to Nicaragua was on. By 1536, Francisco de Montejo, governor of Honduras, had proposed a route to his province from Puerto Caballos on the Caribbean coast, with goods being transported overland to the port of Fonseca and the Pacific. Although Honduras did not possess a waterway to build a canal, Montejo recommended the Honduras route because he felt it was safer and the port of Ca uh, and the port of Caballos was healthier than other possible routes across the Caribbean of Panama. 20 years later, the idea for the Honduras Road was revived when the Cabildo, or head of the uh, Guatemala, was convinced by Juan Garcia de Hermosilla to support the show. As Elizabeth P. Iglesia, professor emeritus at the University of Puerto Rico, pointed out, the main objective of the Honduran merchants and political elites was to profit from the trade that discovery and conquest of Peru had sparked by using a road across Honduras. I've done time instead. Not surprisingly, then the merchants and the political elites in Panama and Nicaragua were supposed to were opposed to the Honduras road because in both cases they believed that a road through their respective provinces would be beneficial to their trade and merchants. In this way, then the competition over an interoceanic uh, road across Central America was born. This is somewhat of a simplification of historical events, but it highlights and characterizes the competition over an interoceanic crossing that existed between the provinces in the Kingdom of Guatemala, both during the colonial period and after the region's independence from Spain. Transporting goods across the isthmus of Central America, after all, held great potential from the earliest days as an important source of income for merchants and a source of political power for all other elites. After the early explorations, the plan for establishing a transmission road across the isthmus went dormant, but the increase in piracy in the Caribbean in the 1600s 1600 revived his interest, and after England's capture of Jamaica from Spain in 1655, and Morgan sacked Panama, this took on more significance for Spanish authorities and colonies. Then in 1698, the Scotsman William Patterson planted a colony in the east coast of Darien in modern day Panama and tried to establish a trade route to the Pacific. Had Patterson been successful, this would have, after 1707, secured for Britain the keys to breaking Spain's monopoly of trade in the New World. Critically, Patterson um, had, uh, had set out that the, a road across the, the region was practical. Uh, during the 1830s, in the height of the, uh, uh, of the Civil War in Central America, the seizure of the port of Omoa by rebel forces loyal to Honduran elites 
Um, imperial the Guatemalan merchants uh, um, and political elites' ambitions for restoring Guatemala's city's dominance over the kingdom. Indeed, the civil war had exposed the deep fractures that existed between provinces in Central America, in, in the United Provinces of Central America, and the rivalry eventually led to the collapse of the federation in, in 1839. In the end, the Guatemalan authorities failed to stitch together the constituent part of the kingdom, uh, and this severely undermined their ability to maintain their dominance. The gold rush in California in the 1840s led to projects for establishing renewed projects, uh, interest in projects for establishing a road across the isthmus, and that took on new urgency. And in the rapidly changing situation, Nicaragua emerged as the forerunner for relocating the crossing. Uh, in 1846, for example, Nicaragua, the Nicaraguan government was actively seeking capital and support to develop the road via the San Juan River. However, this did not meet with any success from British investors. And, and even King Louis Philippe uh, of France also rejected appeals for support for, Nicar for the Nicaragua Road because he preferred the Panama Road. Interest in a Honduras Road or Crossing also revived in the 1840s and 50s, and by 1853, Ephraim George Squire, who previously served as United States Consul to Central America, had started promoting a project for construction of a railway across Honduras. And his support for, uh, for the Honduras Road came from an unlikely source. Lord Malmesbury at the time, the British Foreign Secretary. Neither Honduras nor the Nicaragua roads were built, and in 1855, a railroad was built across Panama. In the case of Nicaragua, their efforts were also undermined by the, by the filibustering enterprises of William Walker uh, in that province. In this dynamic and ever-changing landscape in the region, the Guatemalan authorities and consulado continued with their efforts at establishing the uh, interoceanic crossing or transistor crossing in Guatemala. Pedro de Aysenena, then Guatemala's foreign minister uh, offered a carrot to entice both Britain and France in the form of significant concessions for establishing a canal route through Guatemala, but this was not taken up. Aysenena's concession to the French was for establishing a route from ocean to ocean through Guatemala. However, the Anglo-Guatemala Treaty of 1859 offered the Guatemalans another opportunity to counter the initiatives uh, of Honduras, Nicaragua, and Panama by securing investments needed for building a car road from a port on the coast near to Belize uh, um, to the capital. And this was from the uh, concession was from the British uh, Charles Lennox White, uh, the negotiator. But White recognized that even before the, the agreement of 1859 was concluded, that the Guatemala project for a trans eastern road to uh, that province would undercut the Honduras Railway uh, project uh, and also undercut Felix Bellis Canal Project in Nicaragua while presenting an opening for extending British influence in the region. White therefore argued that the Honduras and Nicaragua projects were nothing but brilliant dreams incapable of ever being realized. Uh, indeed, they were never realized. Unfortunately for Guatemala, neither did Britain, Britain pay the 50,000 pounds Guatemala eventually agreed for construction of the park road. So I've attempted to offer a fresh and alternative explanation for the inclusion of the provision of the construction of a park road, uh, Article 7 in the anglo guatemalan Treaty of 1859. I've argued that the reason for the British negotiators' inclusion of, uh, of the cart road uh, provision in the agreement is best understood in the context of Guatemalan historiography. Indeed, the cart road was instrumental to the Guatemalan authorities and merchants' desire and plans for maintaining their economic, uh, maintaining and expanding their economic and political dominance in the kingdom uh, during the 19th century. That is from the late colonial period um, all the way through uh, the period after independence uh, up to the Consulado's final suppression in 1871. Guatemala had never been identified as a possible site for locating an interoceanic crossing in Central America. But I can show you now um, all the sites that were actually. Um, Identified. So in Panama, they had th three, four, five of them, Nicaragua, and then Tehantepec in Mexico. Guatemala felt that it could bring one across its territory and then Honduras and Puerto Cabez all the way. And they're actually working on those projects now. We're trying to raise the funds for them now. So Guatemala had never been identified as a possible site for locating a canal crossing. And this threatened to undermine its dominant position in the region. Yet the Guatemalan authorities and the consular always believed that if they could establish a road between Isabel on the coast near to Belize, to the capital, they not only would have been able to parry the British trade taking place through Belize, but they also would have been able to maintain their dominance over the trade and commerce of the region. More importantly, though, 
uh, they thought that they would have been able to establish the long sought after interoceanic crossing between the Atlantic uh, and Pacific Oceans before any of the other provinces could do so. so. <laughs> Sorry that we can't take questions today, but I know that the other speakers who are following do have a question for time as well. But I suggest that we hold our questions and maybe we can have those conversations yeah. at the end. Just to say, mm -hmm. at the beginning, there you mentioned the Rampal Institute, who are also sponsoring mm -hmm. the wine reception, which unfortunately can really only work for the in person delegates, I'm afraid. Sorry, I'm like folks, um, but uh, there will be a chance to talk there more about this evening. So thank you very much indeed. That's a fascinating the amount of detail you've done that's absolutely fantastic. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, invite Mel uh, if she could try to share the screen. <laughs> okay, everybody. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? hear you great and we'll okay see. awesome all right i'm gonna try to share my screen um let's just see what happens here <laughs> are you seeing my well not yet um now so i'm just gonna see why we're struggling to get external let me try there's there's different options i could Let's see. Well, I think we have you now. Uh, we can see. We can see. Uh, you can uh, see my. Well, see a screen. Yeah, we see it now. That's perfect. We see it. Was awesome. Uh, okay. Perfect. And if you'd like to try and go to full screen, if you wish, you can try it now. Yeah, I will. I'll just let me get myself going try. here. Uh, full full screen. Yep, I will. Hold on. <laughs> That, that's great. So it's going to introduce Thomas and joins us from Georgetown, Texas, uh, and she's going to tell us Lucy's story. Oh, you. Yes. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you very much to the UK Belize Association for the invitation to speak at your annual meeting. I feel very honored to do that. Um, what I'm talking about today is a tiny oh yeah is a tiny part of a book project that extends my first book, Becoming Creole, Nature and Race in Belize, back to the 1700s to both the Mosquito Shore or the Caribbean coast of Honduras and Nicar Nicaragua, which Dr. Gomez was just talking about, and Belize. The kinds of questions I'm asking are informed by my ethnographic interest in Belizean Creole culture and my family ties to the same people whose history I'm researching. Um, I've been married into these networks myself for nearly 30 years. Please see these two slides. I'm not going to talk through them for the people that made this project possible and the scholars who inspire me. Today, I tell the story of Lucy Partridge, an enslaved mulatto or light-skinned Black woman who was freed and then became wealthy during her short life in the late 1700s on the Mosquito Shore. That she is present in archival records is a minor miracle. That pres presence tells us many things that I share below, but leaves many more questions unanswered. What is available in these records is just a small window into everyday life on the shore <clears throat> in the late 1700s. <clears throat> Lucy's life is fleshed out most in the records of a court case in 1785, five years after she had died. The jurors who, jurors who heard it and presided over it were some of the most powerful men on the shore and in the bay at the end of the 18th century. Presiding was James Lowry, and serving as jurors were John Wagner, James Bartlett, Richard Francis O'Brien, John Skeen Thompson, and James Dundred Yarborough, the American loyalist for whom part of Lee City is now named. For two full days, their attention focused on the life and status of Lucy Partridge. That in and of itself is fascinating, that a previously enslaved Black woman would occupy the interest and attention of these wealthy white enslaving men. Equally interesting is that the details of this court case were recorded. Court was held regularly, cases heard regularly, long and complicated ones, but only every once in a while is a full record of a case extant. The ink, the paper, the time of the recorder were all costly. This case mattered. It mattered because it had the potential to bolster the fortunes of a white man, Aaron Young, who later became a magistrate in early Belize. The case had two parts. It challenged the fact of Lucy's freedom, and it questioned whether or not she left a will. 
Aaron Young was trying to prove Lucy was free and that she left his estate, her estate to his friend Daniel Young, with Daniel in turn leaving his estate to Aaron. Numerous witnesses testified, most of whom were themselves power brokers of the Mosquito Shore and the Bay of Honduras. But Lucy Partridge also shows up in nearly 40 other entries in the Mosquito Shore records in the Belize Archives and Records Service. Partridge was deliberate and intentional in her recording of so many documents. By making records of her transactions, she ensured that her capacity to be free and to engage in the economic, social, and political life at Black River was as clear as possible, given that she was a Black woman. The story of Lucy's life emerges like a jigsaw puzzle under completion, with each transaction record, the court case, and the larger social, economic, and ecological context all constituting the pieces of the puzzle. The picture that develops reveals some key factors of how race, color, gender, class, slavery, freedom, and the socio-environmental world operated in the 1770s. Well, whoops. Lucy Partridge's movement from being an enslaved woman to a well-to-do free woman starts with being purchased by a white man to be his wife. This event was testi testified to in the Replevin trial. Wealthy white slaver Henrietta, now in her third marriage, was deposed. She stated that she had seen Lucy, a mulatto slave woman, being sold at public vendue. John Broster, a white man who was sometimes identified as a tavern keeper in records, but who was also a small-scale merchant, he dealt in deerskins, among other things, was at this vendue. He evidently made it known that he wished to par purchase Partridge to be his wife, as Henrietta put it. It was not possible for Partridge to legally be Broster's wife because she was enslaved, and it was difficult for even a free woman of color and white man to find a clergyman willing to marry people across these emerging racial lines. Henrietta's use of the term wife, however, reflected common practice in this part of the world at that time. Most people living in the shore and in the bay at this time were not white. Most of the small number of white British men living here were in long-term relationships with women of color who were referred to in wills and other records interchangeably as housekeepers and wives. It was this kind of union that Broster was hoping to create through purchasing Lucy. Lucy was in demand though. Henrietta had wanted her then husband, William Stotsbury, a wealthy white planter at Black River to purchase Partridge for her own use. But when another man told Stotsbury that Broster wanted to purchase Lucy for a wife, Stotsbury stepped back. The man's interest superseded that of the woman. Lucy's being mulatto, which in and of itself meant that her birth was the result of the violent intimacy of slavery in the Caribbean, made this competition over her much more likely. Lighter skinned, more white adjacent women, whether enslaved or free, saw more opportunity than darker skinned, blacker women. This colorism part and parcel of the very beginning of the Atlantic slave trade and persisting until today. That Broster wanted her for a wife suggested that she was likely young and comely as well. But being young, light-skinned and beautiful did not mean that she could avoid being sold at public auction, sold as an object, subject to being prodded and inspected in front of a gaggle of potential buyers for whom the public vendue was a sporting affair a time to eat, drink, and be merry, as well as purchase things, including people, including Lucy. Sometime after he purchased her, probably within at most a few years, Broster officially manumitted Partridge. Henrietta testified to this and, noticed that she, and noted that she was aware that Broster had paid to have the manumission recorded, but like many records in this part of the world at this time, this manumission paper was lost. Indeed, the whole record book in which it had been written was, went missing, as Captain James Hoy, a white British army lieutenant, testified. Hoy also recalled that Broster paid yet again to have the manumission recorded. It is highly likely that Broster did this at Partridge's behest. Lucy Partridge knew well how tenuous freedom for a woman of color could be in the 1700s. While it was not unusual for slavers to manumit the women who became their wives, though often this was done when they were old or after the owner's death, it was unusual for those many minute women to start wheeling and dealing like Lucy did. Starting in 1770, Lucy became very active in the affairs of the shore and began to become a wealthy woman. The records reveal that she was situated in a complex network of economic and social relations, and through these connected to a variety of people and a variety of significant events and social dramas in this part of the world. This social and economic network also spanned across the Atlantic world and illustrates how people lived trans-imperially, 
transatlantically, and across places within the Caribbean, like Belize, the Mosquito Shore, Jamaica, and Roatan in the 1700s. The first transfer of property to Lucy, according to the records available, was made by the will of Free Betty. In March of 1770, Free Betty, who because she was a free black woman had to specify not only that she was free, but also who her former owner was in this document, appointed Lucy as her executor and left to Lucy part of, quote, whatever she may possess, close quote. Free Betty identified Lucy as her friend, the housekeeper of John Broster, and gave her one enslaved person and an Indian boy named Jack. When I first read of transactions like these, I was startled. Wouldn't Lucy and Free Betty, for that matter, have wanted nothing at all to do with this hideous institution that limited their own lives? But a close look at the records of economic transactions on the shore made it clear that enslaved people were a very safe way, perhaps the only safe way, for people to transfer wealth to one another and to transfer wealth that will grow. Betty giving Lucy Jack ensured this value for Lucy, ensured that Lucy might be able to have more control over her own life. Lucy Partridge's ability to live as a free black woman was predicated on how much wealth she had and her ability to shape life on the shore for others only increased as she accumulated more wealth. Partridge received property next from her former owner, now household partner, Broster, whose first gift was a quote, Negro wench, close quote, Jenny, in December of 1770. In the next two years, he gave her two more enslaved people, one of whom he purchased from Jamaica. Then, in January of 1773, Broster sold to Lucy at what appears to be a somewhat discounted price, a plantation, a plot of land on which to grow subsistence crops or crops for local exchange, complete with an enslaved Negro watchman and a house lot at Black River near a prominent family. Sometime in this same year, Broster and Partridge parted. After her relationship with Broster ended, Lucy Partridge entered into a relationship with a different significant white man at Black River, Daniel Young. Young first shows up in shore records listed as a mariner, racialization unspecified, meaning that he was white. As a mariner, he provided services for people, moving cattle, moving large numbers of enslaved people. In some records, he is listed as a merchant. But more significantly for the story of the Bay and the Shore overall, he had a connection to Aaron Young, a man who appeared not to be his kin despite the sh shared surname. Aaron was Daniel's good friend, as Daniel Young specified in his will, and Daniel bequeathed all of his possessions to Aaron Young. Aaron Young went on to become the magistrate in Belize's early history who got into a fracas with the free man of color, Joshua Jones, over Jones being awarded a house lot in Belize City in the same manner that white men were being awarded house lots. Aaron Young saw this as an affront to the respectability of the social hierarchy that placed white people above people of color. Jones pushed back, and the ensuing, ensuing altercation ultimately led to the removal of Edward Despard as superintendent of the settlement at Belize. Daniel Young and Lucy Partridge ent entered into a formal partnership in 1775, giving half ownership to each other of a large amount of property. Young gave to Partridge half ownership of six quote unquote Negro and two quote unquote Indian enslaved people. Tellingly, Partridge did not give Young half ownership of the enslaved people she owned but instead she gave them half ownership of the real estate she had purchased from Broster, the house lot um, in town at Black River and her land at Johnson's Creek. After this, they continued to add to their estate together. Five more enslaved people and several lots of land were recorded. The transactions continued into 1780, the year that Lucy traveled quote, to the islands in, such, in a bad state of health from whence she never returned, close quote. Lucy Partridge died in Roatan. Four years later, Daniel Young died at Black River. During the 12 or so years that archival records reveal her activity on the shore, Lucy Partridge was involved with 27 transactions involving enslaved people, sometimes leading to manumission, but often it, it appears that she was amassing wealth and thereby acquiring status. Through the course of these transactions, she engaged with a wide array of types of people, from individuals in the elite predator class, like the children of William Pitt, the wealthiest, wealthiest man on the shore, and other wealthy white slavers, and Captain Peter Wade, who she paid in Sarsaparilla for an enslaved Negro man, to free people of color and many minted black women. Her wheeling and dealing reached across seas and oceans to secure her arrangements, her business arrangements. Her push to acquire property, capital, can be understood as her savviness about how to navigate life on shore 
on the shore as a previously enslaved black woman. The more property she owned, the less she would be questioned, the more she could live freely. That she owned land for subsistence agriculture and then also bargained to be able to pay with sarsaparilla suggests that she took part in the wide ranging and flexible ecologically linked economy of Black River and her life articulated with key social dramas that marked Belize's early history. I've only shared one example, there are a few more. Lucy Partridge was in a variety of relations with black women and she made sure these were marked in the public records on the shore. I already shared Free Betty's interaction with Partridge in 1770, Free Betty being the first person who gave Partridge property. Seven years later, in August of 1777, Partridge engaged with Phoebe at Black River. Phoebe was a free black woman who went by multiple names. In 1777, that name was Phoebe Crawford, but she had also been known as Millicent and as Phoebe Petrican. These shifting names themselves illustrate the social process of enslavement. One's name changed frequently depending on one's owner. Presumably it was her choice in 1707 to be Phoebe Crawford. Just as Lucy Partridge made clear in each record that her chosen name was Partridge, I have hunted for partridges in records from that time and in places she might have been and have found no others. I wonder if she created that name herself. Phoebe Crawford herself was a significant node in social networks that marked the history of Belize. Phoebe belonged to Lawrence Crawford, likely the primogenitor of the Crawford family living in Belize today. In the 1760s, Lawrence Crawford owned land near Crooked Tree, a place associated with the Crawford surname today. When Crawford made out his will in 1756 in Belize, Bay of Honduras, he specified the manumission of Phoebe at his death. So Belize, not Black River, had been Phoebe's home. But Phoebe's life spans beyond even the shore and the bay as Lucy Partridge's determined recording of Phoebe's manumission and economic transactions reveals. Partridge's first transaction with Phoebe was in Black River and was to sell to Phoebe a Negro man slave, Hector, for only 30, I went too far, gotta go back. Previous, previous, yeah. Um, oh, I jumped too far, anyway. Hector for only 35 pounds, which is less than what was normally paid for an enslaved adult male at this time, unless he was old or otherwise infirm. A year after Phoebe purchased Hector from Partridge, Partridge paid to have Phoebe's manumission re-recorded. By May of the following year, Phoebe must have been ill she wrote her will, giving her possessions at Black River in part to Partridge and making Partridge executrix. But the will also bequeathed to Phoebe's son, a George Lewis, who she stated was living in Jamaica, all of her possessions in the Bay of Honduras. Although in 1778, Phoebe, like many people who had resided in Belize prior, was now living in Black River, she retained property in Belize and at least one of her children lived neither in Belize nor Black River, but rather Jamaica. In her role as executor of Phoebe Crawford's will, Lucy Partridge again dealt in enslaved people. This time she sold enslaved people that Phoebe owned. She sold Diana and Diana's two daughters, interestingly named Phoebe and Lucy, were they namesakes for Phoebe Crawford and Lucy Partridge, for 70 pounds to another free black woman, Cynthia Forbes. A year later in 1779, Cynthia Forbes died and her will specified that all her possessions, once her debts were paid, go to her loving friends, Elizabeth Williams and Olive Randall, a free Negro women of Black River. It is through the efforts of Partridge that Cynthia Forbes acquired enough wealth to herself uplift other Black women to contribute to the long-term welfare of her two free Black women friends. Lucy Partridge was also in relationship with women of higher status. There is a small but telling remembrance in the testimony delivered at Partridge, Partridge's trial. Martha Pitt Bode, wife of an influential and well-to-do white man on the shore and daughter of the white wealthy founder of the Black River Settlement, William Pitt, who also spent his first years in Central America in Belize, recalled spending time with Partridge. She recounted that she and Partridge strolled in the plaza at Black River while her husband, Philip Bode, and Partridge's uh, partner, Daniel Young, counted the money involved with Partridge and Young's purchase of Chance, a Negro man's slave. Martha recalled Partridge sharing that she was in partnership with Daniel Young, that what belonged to her belonged to him alike. No other elite woman recalled publicly socially strolling with Lucy. This is significant. While Martha likely appeared white, she was William Pitt's illegitimate daughter, as Pitt specified in his will, because Pitt was not married to Martha's mother. Martha's mother was reputed to have been a Spanish woman that Pitt rescued from a raid, but she may well have also had indigenous ancestry. 
Because she was less pure in her whiteness, there was potentially less social opprobrium for Martha to socialize with a form formerly enslaved woman than had she been a white woman born in England. Lucy Partridge, no matter how wealthy she might have become, still bore the stigma of slavery, both through people knowing she had been enslaved and through the color of her skin. Despite Lucy Partridge, uh, the final component of Lucy Partridge's story is the outcome of the trial. Partridge was indeed free and did indeed, indeed write a will to which several deponents testified. She also had her last will and testament delivered to Henrietta for safekeeping, and it was supposedly stored in Roatan, but it was lost. Two of the witnesses, both white men, recalled seeing it and hearing Partridge talk of it. They could readily recall that Partridge left the bulk of her estate to her partner, Daniel Young, and each of them could remember that there were other legatees, women, but these wealthy white men could not recall their names. Could not recall their names. It was precisely this kind of erasure that Lucy's Par Lucy Partridge's close attention to having all of her transactions recorded attempted to preclude. And indeed, the remainder of the trial, a consideration of the ownership of a number of enslaved people, depended on Lucy Partridge's having had those transactions recorded to keep property where Lucy wanted it to be. But the women that she said had wanted to receive property from her at her death never did. And in the end, Daniel Young, a white man, received all, structurally re-encoding the stickiness of whiteness, masculinity, and wealth, despite Lucy Partridge's fastidiousness with using the public record. The story of Lucy Partridge yields insight in how gender, color, race, wealth, and slavery intersected on the Mosquito Shore. It also suggests that close readings of archival materials can yield information about the people most often exclu excluded from archival records. A previously enslaved black woman became a significant economic player in this world, using the acquisition of property to ensure that she could live freely. But she only became free because a white man purchased her to be his wife. She also used her capacities and resources to assist other free black women. The social and economic net networks that knit people together at this point in time in British Central America extended across lines of class and race and tied people together in complicated ways. And these networks also pulled together a host of places, not only at Black River and the other small communities adjacent to it on the Mosquito Shore, but also in the settlement at Belize, up the rivers and creeks of that settlement, to ports in England, and places like Roatan and Jamaica. People who quote unquote lived at Black River were denizens of the Atlantic world. Although I did not develop this point as much, Lucy Partridge's transactions also show how a variety of components of the natural world are part of the social and economic systems at Black River. And her untimely death illustrates the role that disease likely played here. But in the end, the outcome of her trial also shows how readily whiteness, masculinity, and wealth stick together and reproduce a gender, class, and color hierarchy. Hold on. I have a quick question. That's for the we have time to take a couple of questions. So one thing. Okay. Hmm? Melissa, first of all, thank you so very much for agreeing to do this talk. Uh, this is such an important area for a full understanding of Belize's history. It's as important as the relationship between Belize and Yucatan, which has been explored recently. But this um, relationship between Belize and the shore, it still needs a lot of scholarship. And as you pointed out so eloquently, we tend to think of these places for the time being in isolation. But how connected are they? Thank you very Thanks. much. Yeah, they're extremely connected. I didn't even get to mention um, Peter. I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story of the Flowers family and. Uh, flowers, Negroes, I'm not sure, maybe you're not familiar, but a significant feature of Belize's history is the Flowers family who actually ensured the, um, that the battle at St. George's Key was, 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 was fought rather than not fought. And Peter Wade has ties to Bristol, that's where he was from, I believe. And it was, the and William Flowers was from Bristol. His and the enslaved people he owned, um, who he had taken, he bought, purchased in Belize first, then he took to the Mosquito Shore, Peter Wade tried to re-enslave them. So Peter Wade and Lucy had these interactions and about four years later, P Peter Wade has this thing from William Flowers' estate to try to re-enslave um, Flowers Negroes who were 
uh, technically free according to what flowers have told people. So yes, yeah, so it's not, yeah, there really is this incredible network of connections of people being tied across Ooh. the Atlantic world. Neil, if I may, could I ask a question, please? Yes, yeah. we have time for questions, go ahead. Uh, hi, Mel. Uh, I'm Rich Watton, um, son of Patty Woods Watton and grandson of Dickie Woods and Lucy Miles Loring. That's my Belizean heritage. I get the death narrative that you're talking about. Death of whiteness, death of wealth, death of this perpetuating sector of white stickiness generating wealth. I get the death. I get the transformation that you're helping us through, you know, by taking this and bringing this to the light. I get that, and I'm very, very grateful that from that, from my own family's heritage, which is as murky as anybody else that comes from Belize. But what I'm struggling with here is understanding what your rebirth narrative is. Is your rebirth narrative that you can be a mulatto slave, be made free, trade in this murky, dark world of white male wealth, and then emerge with something to hand on? I'm struggling with understanding what the rebirth narrative to help us move out of, you know, the, the culture and into a better way of living and handing on something better to our children. That's a fantastic question. This is the, I, I teach anthropology. I'm about to teach an intro course. One of my students just walked in my classroom. This is my struggle. I, I don't know. I mean, the, the sto Lucy's story is incredibly complicated that way, right? For the very reasons you just say, she's using the system that we all condemn and we, we say we want to break from, but it's through using that system that she's able to gain some manner of well-being for other people who have been destroyed by that system. So I don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry. that, But I think that's, I mean, I think that's what the current movements for justice all around the world are trying to grapple with, from Black Lives Matter to Palestinian liberation to reparations work in Belize. There's nothing straightforward about this. We, we are in transformation. If you take a, a genetic swab of me, you'll find that I'm 1% Bantu. You're basically, I'm 9% black through to some, through 81% white. But if you look into the whiteness of me, you can definitely see the Norwegian slave, you know, the Norwegian, the Vikings well, I, and I the Anglo Saxon side. I actually so teach about interested. how the, the genetics, the genetic testing doesn't tell you much at all, really. If you look at the fine print, that's something I also teach on. But, um, but your cultural heritage is what matters. And and Belizeans' cultural heritage, especially light-skinned, more elite Belizeans like you, is really complicated. And I don't know what the best way forward for that is. What is my what is my role as white lady from the U.S. who's married into a Belizean Creole family? Yeah, no, it's. it's I think it, it's, for for all of us, it's to hang with the transformation and understand that the past has to die. It needs to be reborn, but we haven't got a we haven't got a rebirth narrative yet. I, no, we do and, not, and, and, and we're all struggling with one desperately. Exactly. And we desperately need it. A, yeah. a, 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 a rebirth narrative. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. Thank you, Mel. Melissa, I've, I've always, a wonderful talk, by the way, and I've always believed that the interconnection between the bay and the shore is a really crucial missing episode of Belizean historiography, and your talk today illustrated that perfectly. But what I was struck by was the amount of uh, uh, material on the Mosquito shore mm -hmm. in the Belize archives, and I didn't realise that. And is that unique or is it replicated in the National Archives in London? There are bits and pieces, I believe, in the National Archives because some things were sent back, right? They would have copies sent to uh, London occasionally. But the, uh, the Belize records, I'm pretty sure, are unique. And Mary Alpuche, who is amazing in the Belize Archives and Records Service, she's just amazing. Um, when she learned that I was interested in this back in 2019, she went through and created a finding aid for them. So now they're really easy to search through and find stuff. I, when I first looked at them, I had to read through each of them individually and that was quite a bit. And they, they took a long time for them to restore them. And of course there's tons missing, but it's a really rich source. Yeah. Is it, is it digitized? Yes, absolutely. It is digitized. Yeah. Yeah, I'm working with Carl often on another project on this and hoping this will become a book down the pike. <laughs> Oh, wait. So, so interesting to hear a little bit about the archives. I've done a little, little, little bit of trying to sort of investigate the Mosquito Coast, but I was led to believe that as a sort of protectorate, it was actually administered from Jamaica, and therefore sort of the, where the archives are is and presumably Jamaica, but there's a big question mark. Is that right? Well, it, it depends on what you're interested. I'm sure the government records about how to govern by the uh, white men who governed 
those probably are largely, or they're, I'm sure they're at least copies in Jamaica, but what's in Belize are the records made by private individuals, a lot of them, who wanted things recorded, like a manumission paper or a sale of a piece of land between two people. So if you're interested in history from below, the mosquito records in the Belize Archive Service are actually probably better than what you would find in Jamaica or London. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. That's wonderful. I, I just like, I wanted to let those questions run there because it just see there's so many people simulated to answer uh, and, and to pose those questions to Melissa. So a huge thanks to Melissa. Um, Thank you. Also, just to say to colleagues, we, you'll be aware that we're running slightly on police time. We are about 30 minutes out of the train now, so it's, isn't it? We are about 30 minutes behind schedule. Um, Sarah Metcalf is about to come on and, and talk to us. Um, for the colleagues who are here in the room, uh, some tea and coffee and biscuits have arrived next door. So what I was going to suggest is that we will bring Sarah on, but uh, I, I kind of warned her that that might be a, a, a small hiatus where a couple of people pop out and get biscuits and things. But if we can do that in, in a way to try and keep the schedule, so we won't actually hold the next talk, we'll, we'll bring Sarah in. But if you want to drop out and bring, bring yourselves drinks through, that would be great. So Mel, thank you very much indeed. That's been wonderful. And if I could ask Sarah Metcalf to come in now and uh, maybe you could share your screen. We'll just check that that's all working uh, fine for Sarah. So yes. um, let me uh, briefly introduce Sarah as people are rushing around got the drinks in the room. Sarah, thank you for joining us. We understand that you're about to travel to Belize. Uh, as part of the Icarus project. So we are super excited to hear about this. Uh, we've heard lots of good things about the work that's happening. A brilliant operation project. It would be really good for you to help us put the pieces of that together. So can I introduce Sarah McCarth from the University of Nottingham? Thank you, Neil. And good afternoon, good morning, depending on, on where you are. Um, so I'm just going to try and give you a, a brief sort of overview of Icarus and, and what we're trying to do. Um, so just a bit of background. My background is looking at long-term climate change and human environment interactions um, using lake sediments. But over the last few years, particularly in the Mexican part of Yucatan, um, I've started working on the impacts of extreme weather events. Uh, I have a PhD student who's working with Maya, uh, small-scale farmers of Maya heritage in both Mexico and Belize. And this project sort of comes out of that as trying to use Belize almost as a, as a test bed to develop some new approaches to looking at resilience to climate and climate variability over different timescales. So we know that droughts and hurricanes are likely to become uh, more extreme, if not more frequent. Uh, we know that Belize is particularly vulnerable to, to climate variability partly because of a heavy reliance still on agriculture and forestry and fishing, and that natural disasters can cause massive losses to the economy. And of course, fairly recently still, the uh, 2019 drought, sorry, just spotted the typo, um, led to very significant um, economic losses. But we also know, looking um, over longer time scales, that droughts have played a major part in disruptions and reorganizations over, over different time periods. So the aims of um, Icarus are to really see how we can build um, a better understanding of resilience to climate change by learning from the past and the present, to try to look at both the natural and human environments together, and to integrate records of very different types things that are not normally brought together. So instrumental records, earth observation, community experience, historical records, paleo, environmental and archeological data. And um, just as I say, to, to try and get those um, all together. So by trying to merge these things, um, which I think is fairly ambitious, um, we hope to build a deeper understanding of resilience and then to think what we can learn from that to perhaps make things um, a little easier in the future. So this figure just tries to summarize some of the approaches that we're using. Um, as I say, instrumental, historical, lived experience and paleoarchaeological. Now I'm actually gonna run through those in reverse order almost um, in the talk. 
So this is just the background to the, this is the team. Um, we come from a whole variety of um, disciplinary interests and backgrounds. We have ecological modelers, we have earth observation specialists, environmental historians, an archeologist, um, and, uh, and a few geographers thrown in for good measure. We also have, and very importantly, um, an advisory panel, including people from the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, in Belize and the Yaxe Conservation Trust and the Ministry of Agriculture, Food Security um, and Enterprise um, have also been very heavily involved in the early stages of the project. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, partners from elsewhere as well. So I want to start with the paleo archeological side. I'm sure you're all aware of how much interest there is in the Maya and changes wow. in Maya settlement and the fate or otherwise of the Maya, um, subject to the vagaries of climate change. Um, thousands and thousands of papers are published on this now, and it's an ever increasing number. And so the map on the right um, comes from a freely available resource, which shows the atlas of ancient Maya sites uh, across Belize. And I hope you can see just, of course, how many of them there are. And this was actually only as known in, in 2010. So there's a very rich resource out there. And what we started doing, and this is Alec McLennan's work, is to simply put together a database using all the information that's out there, but using a whole variety of sources, um, quite a lot actually of reliance on um, excavation reports, many of which are not are never published, unfortunately, um, but also using some of the published materials as well. So to look at um, exactly where they are, and that's not always as straightforward as you might imagine, but also to look at um, the start and end date of the settlement, any long count dates that are there. Very interested if, to see if there's any information about water management strategies or soil management strategies uh, and things like lime production, anything that might have had an impact, uh, a wider impact on the environment or reflect changes in that environment. And then the other side of it is to have a database of paleoclimate records. <clears throat> These are relatively restricted for Belize itself, actually, compared with some of the adjacent areas in Mexico and indeed northern Guatemala. But again, we're looking at what's the age range, what evidence do we have for things like <clears throat> erosion or deforestation, <laughs> excuse me, changes in uh, vegetation, forest recovery, and particularly if we have evidence for droughts. <laughs> so as a sort of starter on this, and this work's not been going on very long, we've been looking at the dates of abandonment, decline or secession. Cessation, so we have 135 sites in this database, and essentially any of the um, dark red and dark orange dots on the map show sites that were abandoned in the 9th and 10th centuries. And as you go through to the sort of paler wow. colours and then into the blue, this is right through to sites that were occupied into the 16th century. And on the right hand side, you can see I've put some blocks around those dots. So what we tend to see is that sites in the west of the country uh, and a lot of those sites um, in the main river valleys were amongst the earliest to be abandoned, whereas it's the sites in the north and along the coast that were abandoned uh, later. And we're going to look uh, in a bit at um, some information from two areas, the three valleys in the north and the Belize River, sort of in the middle. So the second type of source we're looking at is historical records. Um, to date, there's been very, very little work on the Spanish archives um, for this area. Uh, we don't really know, I think, how many there are and what they're going to tell us. Obviously, for the British period, and we've heard um, in the previous two talks, um, some use of those archives. Um, copious, actually, relatively speaking, copious amounts. So looking at a whole range of things, not only the standard things like diaries, reports, um, court documents, but also trying to find evidence of um, pre-modern meteorological records. And I've just put in the table some examples of some of the um, types of events you find and the impacts that get described from those. Um, this is work that's ongoing. This is uh, work that Oriol is doing. And he is just off to Belize this weekend to, to actually go to the archives in Belmapan, 
um, as it turns out. So this is just a representation of some of the things that have come out of that work. So the different colored dots represent different types of climate hazards. So the blue is floods um, and the reds are droughts and the sort of deep blue colored hurricanes. And what I think you can begin to see is that there are clear clusterings of some of these. Um, so we've got particular um, uh, extreme events in 1787, for example, there was a very uh, extreme drought in the summer, apparently. Um, and then we have um, in 1907, again, lots of evidence of drought in the pre-instrumental period. And we see also evidence for hurricanes. We do have a little bit of information going back to the 17th century, but that's that's very sparse so far. So what we see here is we get to the point where we can begin to intersect the, his, the information from the written archives with some of the instrumental data that we can have as well. Now, there's a hell of a lot of text on here, so please don't attempt to read it. But um, we've heard mention about the links to Jamaica in the previous talks. And what we see here is actually food supplies coming in from Jamaica in response to drought, um, both, both in response to drought or indeed to hurricanes and flooding. Um, we see obviously development of water storage techniques, but then of course that sometimes brought with it side effects because stored water, stagnant water could often lead to more disease. People moving uh, away from Belize City into um, into the interior sometimes, into rivers. The transport of water across Belize, for example, from the Manatee River, and in some cases, actually shipping water from New Orleans. I have to say that was a, a new one on me. So I think a lot of very interesting responses here to those extreme events uh, in terms of adaptation, uh, relocation, uh, the distribution of aid and, and cash. I mean, we saw that in response to the 2019 drought, but this actually was nothing new when you look at these records. The other thing that Oriol's um, started to do is to put together this record of historic rainfall data. Um, there's probably more than one might have imagined. It's often, often rather short term, um, but we do think that the archives in Tulane might have um, some more. Uh, and of course, the method of measurement will vary across over time. So we have to watch that as well. If we come to the instrumental period, um, we're really here thinking about meteorological data earth observation data, land use and land cover information, and um, agricultural um, data. So this is the a big database that the Ministry of Agriculture very kindly supplied to us. We found actually that some of their farms aren't where they think they are, but that's an aside. Um, just in terms of meteorology, the, the meteorological records um, for Belize are not good. Uh, the core records, except for the site at the airport, um, really only start from 1979 in a meaningful way. Uh, and we have had a lot of problems using these data. There's a lot of missing data. Uh, there were problems when they moved from the old manual recording methods onto the automatic methods. Unfortunately, the stations weren't calibrated. And so Paul Betsabe, who's been working on this, has torn most of her hair out in trying to uh, make some sense of these. And we've had particular issues with Punta Gorda down in the south. Um, unfortunately, there aren't many other records down from, in, from southern Belize, so that's proved to be quite challenging. And we've also had uh, some issues with some of the interpolated and reanalysis data. But, you know, we are putting things together. So this is just an example. So these are years along the x-axis and monthly data on the y-axis from January to December. And essentially anything that's red is dry. And then when you get into the sort of yellows and blues and greens, that's wet. And so you can begin to see here, obviously you see the early part of the year, the dry season, you see the wet season more in the summer and many of the dark blue um, squares are major tropical storms or hurricanes. Some of the things that comes out in, quite interesting here. Um, obviously, everybody knows about Hurricane Hattie in 1961 and the impact it had on Belize City, but actually it wasn't as wet as Hurricane Anna earlier in the year. So clearly it was other things around wind speed or perhaps other characteristics. And we can also see um, uh, dry years uh, in the 1940s and of course, 2019. And we can 
play around with these data. Now I want to try to draw some of these strands together. So this is a, a long-term compilation of precipitation data from Belize City. So the early part of the record comes mainly from the hospital. Um, we then have some of the older data, the longer, longest data from the airport, which runs back to the 1940s, and then the modern instrumental period in blue on the right-hand side. Um, so we need to do some more work on this, but you can see this huge variability uh, across that record. And interestingly, perhaps no specific trends, at least not in precipitation. So as we try to mesh that um, long-term precipitation record with some of the information in the archives, we can begin to match some of these more extreme, either the droughts or the very wet periods with evidence in the written records to the impacts of those events, you know, about phenomenal rainfall or the destruction of Chiclayan maize, um, sugarcane production impacts, all these sorts of things. And sometimes we're actually finding um, or not finding um, that records, hurricane records are appearing in some of the written archives that are not appearing um, elsewhere, or maybe it's just because it's from the airport. They're, we know they happen, but they're not appearing in the, in the airport precipitation. We've also been looking at using Earth observation data. So this is just an example from the New River Lagoon. This is the NDVI, so this is a vegetation index to show the impact of the 2019 drought. So it's comparing 2018 with 2019. And we obviously know that um, that very dry season had a big impact on the New River Lagoon. It called uh, stagnation and deoxygenation. So we can use some of these sources to look at the impacts of drought and so on. There is an issue though, even with the Earth's observation data, and that's because Belize is cloudy. You all know that. Uh, and if you're interested in the impacts of hurricanes, that really matters. Because quite often the cloud cover is such that you can't actually see what the impact of the hurricane was. So uh, this is worse when we're using the older and lower resolution Landsat data. And it's better when we're using the more recent Sentinel-2 data. But actually the years when you can get complete coverage for the whole of Belize are relatively restricted. Another strand to this, uh, a very important strand, is what we're describing as lived experience. So this is really um, going out and talking to people about their perceptions of climate change, climate change impacts and adaptations. So we made a start on this earlier this year. This was in January with just a few uh, interviews and meetings. And we tried to cover um, across Belize, really in areas of the major crops. So we started in the south with cacao, with citrus, and sort of worked our way up through bananas and up to the um, sugar cane in the north. Um, we had some very valuable conversations, actually, with the National Meteorological Service during that, that visit as well. Um, and we discussed some of these issues with data. And at the moment, um, other, pe other members of the team are out in Belize doing six weeks work. And so far, they've done more than 40 interviews and had more than uh, had a couple of workshops. So we're really building this side of the project. Right, so um, so this is some of the information from that first period of um, uh, discussions. Um, and we, you know, we, we what we can be, or even now begin to see is obviously some correspondence between the information in the historical archives and people's lived experience now. Um, so the second uh, example I want to give of, of tying the past and the present, remember I said that with the archeological information, we'd identified that the Western areas were identified earlier than the um, Eastern areas and the, um, the coastal area and the North. And so we've, I started wondering whether there was something about river systems that made them particularly vulnerable, um, sites near river systems made them particularly vulnerable to weather events. Uh, and so we started using um, a water index information from Sentinel, again, to look at the response of major rivers to um, different um, climate or different weather conditions between different years. So uh, the zooms on the right hand side are from the Belize River Valley. But with this data, you can actually look right at how an individual river is responding. So the top panel are 
um, dry season images from 2021, so they're a composite between January and May, and the lower set of images are from 2022, which was a dry year. And I think you can see, perhaps particularly with the Mopan River and the Belize River, that you can get a sense of how the rivers were shrinking. And each pixel on these images represents 10 meters. So you don't, it doesn't take much change in precipitation really for these rivers to respond very quickly. So this is something we're quite keen to uh, follow up on. I just wanna finish with a few sort of initial uh, reflections. Um, we've clearly now been able to identify extreme climate events from the 17th century on, and as I say, um, we plan to do work or more work on the Spanish colonial period, uh, probably now by going um, to Spain rather than to the AGN. At, um, we did talk about that we're doing work in Merida as well, but there didn't seem to be very much there. <clears throat> we're beginning to think about um, the how we can use those paleo records, um, either paleoclimate or archaeology. And, but I would say again how challenging the meteorological records are. And I think significantly, a number of the big global data sets that are derived from those meteorological data, like the gridded data you can freely get from the University of East Anglia from the Climate Research Unit, are frankly hopeless at catching the climate of Belize. They don't show the modern precipitation gradient. So if you're going to use those gridy data sets to think about future climate impacts, the chances are they are not going to be very helpful. We're beginning to see, uh, get some ideas around the types of adaptation, you know, changes in irrigation, changes in timing of practices. Uh, in the present day, of course, more use of pesticides and um, fertilizers, less likely to be true in the past. Uh, so we've got to think about how we can uh, pick those out over different time periods. One of the things we are definitely going to focus on is the development of water storage practices, because we think we can see that in the archaeological record, in the historical record, and in the present day. And the final strand that we really need to work on going forward is to think about the economic and political context, not only for Belize itself and the varied changes there, but thinking about the changes across the broader Caribbean um, as you know the different spheres of influence change through time and whether they were looking to the Caribbean for help or countries in the Caribbean like Jamaica, or sometimes going to look for help in uh, the southern part of the United States. So I'm going to, and I'll just to say, if you'd like to follow up on any more, we do have a website. Um, so I will stop at that point and I'll stop sharing. So fascinating. So thank you very much indeed for sharing. You've actually got a tremendous amount of different strands there which you're trying to weave together. And we have time for a couple of questions, if that's stimulated questions, either in the room or online. Could we invite people to ask their questions to Sarah, please? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, hi Sarah. Um Chris. Uh, Sarah, just uh, I, I'm sure you I'm sure you um, took account of this, but when you were measuring um, water levels recently, did you take account of the manage the water management from um, the hydroelectricity water storage facility that periodically release water into the Macau River and subsequently the the Belize River? Yeah, we're going to have to do that, Chris. So this was just measuring the width of the river. Yeah. Okay based on the imagery um but yeah that's a good point we this is why we need to look at the management side as well definitely yeah. good great work so then we have time for, for one more comment observation or question i was going to say the challenge of, of, of kind of piecing together the, the, the record sarah is there a, a method which you've identified which can kind of help you to harmonize these slightly disparate records geographically and also uh, in, in terms of the fact that they come from different parts of Belize at different times? Um, so obviously we've, we've we started trying to look at the, at the geography of this. Um, that's easier to do in some cases than others. Um, of course, with the uh, written records, you, they tend to be concentrated in places like Belize City or around Belize City. 
So we did try looking at the distribution of written records through time and across space. But of course, they just reflect where people were. Um, so there's got bound to be a bias in those. Um, there is no, as far as I'm aware, Neil, to answer your basic question, I'm not aware of any existing methodology that really gives you a, a blueprint for how you combine all of this. It just seemed to be something that was worth a try. Um, I freely admit that it may come to a complete grief, in which case we'll have a set of several sets of independent, but um, maybe not overlapping data. But I'm I'm pretty happy now, and I've become increasingly happy over the last three to three to six months that we're beginning to see some areas of overlap where we can uh, integrate across those different types of information. Yeah, I think that. I mean, it, it, it's a great challenge, but but I think there, that you are starting to see evidence. And I really like the way that you're managing to consolidate lots of dense information, the use of the graphics there, and tie that to the archives. And, and as you say, sometimes you get corroboration, and sometimes you get things which appear to be missed. And I think that's kind of also interesting, and you know, scope for for lots more questions from that. So it's brilliant to see that, and it's great to, to see how some of the ideas that Lizzie Rushton had mentioned a few years ago are kind of being picked up and carried forward with this as well. So we do wish you the very best of luck, and we're also very grateful for the interactions that we've been having with Sophia and your colleagues in Belize recently, uh, as she's been interviewing farmers about their adaptation strategies. So that's been a really wonderful cooperation yeah. as well. Uh, that's been a very, very helpful collaboration, Neil. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you for holding for us today, uh, Sarah. And uh, we wish Oriel a safe, safe journey and we look forward to keeping in touch with the project for you. So thank you very much to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that, that, that concludes our sort of research segment part of today's meeting. And now we're going to move into our sort of third and final part of uh, the, the meeting today. I'm going to invite Jacob Dykes. Uh, Jacob is now joining join with us to, to come on to the camera. Hello there, Jacob. Nice to see you. Um, Hi, everyone. And um, welcome. Welcome to, to the meeting, Jacob. And um, we, we, we're going to uh, we have a treat today of seeing an episode, which I think very few people have seen yet, of this new um, film production known as Unknown Bullies. But um, we are obviously delighted to, to, to watch it. But I think it would be great, Jacob, if you could just give us a little bit of context, first of all, to explain uh, what this is, how the uh, European Nature Trust has come to be involved in, in the making of this, um, and, and how, you, how, how you hope this is going to uh, be shown in, in Belize and accessible for different audiences. So would you like to give us a little bit of a uh, background to this adventure, and then we'll watch an episode together. So over to you, Jacob. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much, Neil. F firstly, I guess thank you to all the members of the UK Belize Association for uh, for having me uh, come and introduce this this series. Um, it's uh, it's often quite interesting to try to explain to people uh, what our interest is in in Belize. I mean, the clue is in the name, the European Nature Trust. Um, so it often seems like quite a leap of the imagination. Uh, to think that we as a conservation uh, charity would would be interested in Belize. And uh, there's very good reason for it. Um, I think uh, in the European context, we've witnessed so much degradation of our ecosystems over time. And it's prompted now a real sense of dislocation from nature. Uh, that's, a, that's a sort of abstract thing but uh it has really prompted a real examination of what it means to be connected with nature and to live in reciprocity with it um and i think with that the world needs uh real real conservation leaders and powerhouses and new voices as well on the international stage and so belize i think is as close as you will come to finding a nation that does embody that spirit of environmental stewardship um 
I'm by no means a, a Belizean expert, uh, nor of any heritage or, or, or connection, but I am a huge admirer um, of, of the real uh, ethos of the NGOs that work tirelessly to conserve Belizean nature, not just for the next generation and generations ongoing of Belizeans, but for uh, the global society at large. And so, of course, there's 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 loopholes in that. There's porosities, as there are with with any uh, any nation conserving uh, its natural assets. But Belize has done so much uh, on behalf of of the world to to protect nature, and I think is is leading uh, and shining a very bright light just when we need it most. Um, and so, regards tense involvement, we wanted to help in any way that we felt we could to showcase that to to the world um and we were we were founded by uh by paul lister who's got a lifelong um passion for for belize and a real admiration um and he is a conservationist uh that that likes to support projects that help to engage people uh engage people with the world of conservation and we realized that we were in a position to support in some way with putting together a film series that we hoped would um, showcase the very best in in what Belize has to has to offer the world. Um, this was a this was a four part series that's been over three years in the making. And from the very get go, um, we wanted as much of the series as possible to be all Belizean. So. We worked with a Belizean film crew. Um, we worked with more than 17 uh, environmental NGOs in Belize. And it was a philanthropic production, um, meaning all of the distribution revenues that are part of uh, distribution agreements that we're still currently working on, which I can share with a few of you after the after the screening, um, will be donated back to uh, to the uh, protection and promotion of Belize's environmental wealth. Um, and so really, you know, tense involvement, we were really just the, we were just putting it together as the driving force. This is, this is all Belizean. And um, I want to just, before we uh, dive into the episode, just take a, a moment to thank uh, everyone who made it possible that is all of the NGOs that you know that, that that dedicate so much of their personal and professional time to um, to conserving Belizean nature. Um, that's all of the the donors, many of whom are are, are proud Belizeans, um, who made the production and the post production phases of the um, of the uh, series possible, and also to to everyone in Belize who helped with uh, with in kind. Um, in kind support to help make the production possible and lastly everyone who's going to watch it as well uh, we've all got a role to play in in the conservation of nature and and um, we just hope this film helps to inspire people to uh to go and visit belize um to to understand the country um and and to really connect with with what is uh, an amazing voice in the world of conservation at the moment so thank you to everyone and uh, i hope you enjoy uh, episode four. Uh, it's the last episode uh, in the series, but they don't all follow one another. So uh, you won't be left adrift if you want to dive into the rest of the uh, rest of the series when it becomes available. So thanks very much, Neil. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jacob. So what we'll do now is we'll try and uh, watch that together. And I believe that you'll be uh, staying around um, and taking some questions from online and in person people after we watch this episode together. Mm -hmm.